think to ask it and you were already on it <laughs> and I'm recording there. All right. Ready? My hair's a mess. Oh, well. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails, Famous Fatalities Edition. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-host, S with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you feeling? I, um, you know, I find that every week I come in and go, ooh, I'm feeling a little manic. Sure. Um, and I just realized, I think that's just who I am now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think it's an energy anymore. I think it's just I've morphed into it somehow. Right. Um, so a little manic. I did. I found I ended up with a lot of notes, a lot of notes. And I stayed up very late last night to the point where I was so tired when I went to bed. I don't remember getting into the bed, but I did wake up in it. So I must have. Uh, I even lied to my husband about the time because I didn't want to get in trouble. <laughs> I didn't. I mean, technically, technically, it was not a lie because he asked after he, if I may, and he's probably listening, but he did badger a little. So I finally just said it was after three, which is true because what is after three but four thirty? <laughs> Jesus. Well, I mean, yeah, it's not a lie. What's yeah. after three? A lot of times are after yeah. three, but um, I yeah. look, you can't be killing yeah. yourself for this podcast. Well, here's the thing. I did set an alarm so I could get up. I, I gave myself four hours. I set myself till 830. Well, I immediately woke up, shut it off and woke up at 10. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't quite work out the way I planned. And then, as you know, uh, you received my notes on this episode two minutes before you sent the Zoom link, which is not my <laughs> finest hour, but still somehow not the latest I've ever sent it. So not the latest. Yeah. And um, also I wasn't going to ask. I was like, they'll come when they come and I'll be grateful for them. You know yeah. what I mean? I find that I need to, you would think by now I would know, but I need to get better about my research because I, I need to learn once I get to a point, that's just, you have to stop. Right. But I, I go further. And then rabbit hole and rabbit hole. And before you know it, I don't even know what planet I'm on anymore. And I've got 80 pages of notes and I have to somehow dumb it down to like 20. And it's like, oof, that's going to be a, be, a, be a journey. And so it takes quite a long time to pare down the notes. So I just need to get better about it. And I will by episode 100 or so, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, this is episode 26, and let me tell you, it feels like 2,000 yes, um, in yes. the best possible way. It's yeah. it's a wild ride. I also just want to say a quick shout out to any of our new listeners, because I feel like we've had kind of a an influx recently in recent yes. episodes. So thank you for finding us and joining us and staying with us. We hope you, uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode. This, of course, we're going to be talking about uh, the Notorious B.I.G., in this episode, which, uh, of course, I'm very excited about. This is kind of the companion piece to the Tupac episode we did. It's been a real treat to research because it's one of the first times where a lot of times where we'll go into a case where I kind of know it and then I research further. But this time I kind of knew like the idea of what was going on. Uh, but I knew so many of the people like watching documentaries, they'd pop up on screen. And before the name comes up, I know who that is. And I'm just right. like, oh, look, like it, it, it was like a family reunion over here. <laughs> a true crime family reunion, which yeah. sounds great to me. Um, listen, before we get any further, I need to know the question on everyone's mind. What you yeah. drinking over there? Well, um, I was running late. Sure. Again, it's just who I am now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I tried my best to, to do like a bit of a blue Hawaiian again, because I really like that pineapple juice, mm -hmm. white rum vodka situation. I think just a little too heavy handed on that white rum again. Uh, I have puckered a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> drinking yeah. It. Yeah, she but, has. Um, so it's more of a sloppy blue Hawaiian at this point. But it's going down. It's going down. I like that. Yeah. Uh, now there's huge news over at my house because I'm, I'm drinking something on the show I've never drank before. <gasps> and that is this cut water brand tequila margarita in a can. Oh. Uh, now this is uh, the brand cut water tequila, 
with orange, lime, and triple sec flavors. Now, this is also 12.5% alcohol. Oh, my God. And, <laughs> and I'll tell you a little something. Um, uh, Leslie Seiler, friend of the podcast, uh, she and I got these on a whim once. And we each drank one. It was summer, so we were kind of drinking a little quick. And when we got to the end of our first cans, we were hammered. And we couldn't figure out why. And the reason why is that this is two drinks in one can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what I've decided for some reason tonight, because as you know, I, at the beginning of this year, uh, you know, I was cutting down on the alcohol. I took a little break, yeah. whatnot. Tonight, I've decided to go the other way. And uh, we don't get sponsored by Cutwater yet. Um, but I do have to say, this is a nice drink, especially if you're looking for a margarita and you maybe don't have the things on hand or you, you know, whatever. Um, but it packs a punch. So, um, buckle up listeners. Yeah. Don't be a chucklehead. Just buckle up instead. <laughs> uh, and, uh, get on board for this episode of, of, uh, famous fatalities because, uh, yeah, who knows what's going to happen. Cheers. Oh my goodness. Uh, what I like is I like it's, I think it's part of what I like about Palm Bay is I like, just crack a can and you're good to go. It's consistent. I don't have, I can grab it quickly on the go. I love that I'm making it sound like it's a breakfast sandwich. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for some people it is. I was just going to say that. Yes. Uh, but it's just, it's nice when in these moments where I'm just rushed and I don't have time to mix anything fun, it would just be nice. Just crack a can and I like it. You and know? you know, I got to say, I have been trying to reach out to, to the Palm Bay people I know. to say, Hey, we're big fans. We talk about you a lot on the show. I have not gotten any response. So, dear listeners, if you want to just start to spam them, just start <laughs> tweeting at them, commenting on their socials, tag us. Let's yeah. see if we can get at least a few free Palm Bays for Christy. I mean, we've talked about them on almost every episode of this show. Yeah. And gosh darn it, I think we deserve it. It's it a would, great product. This is the joke. We yeah. love the product, you know? It would be nice to just just like a simple like obviously in your own words but like a i buy i bought palm bay because of them there you they go they love you they talk about you all the time it's like yeah. yes and also if they have hats but that's that's we're getting off track we're already getting off track um listen we were talking earlier about uh, this episode and because, you know, we always like to bring it back to our own lives. Like the good yeah. narcissists we are. I'm kidding. We're not narcissists. We're not. I've taken a lot of personality tests and I can attest we're fine. Um, but this, of course, the story of notorious B I G it's right there in his own name. We got a lot of people, especially males in this story who use nicknames, nicknames as their names. And we we did get into this, obviously, in the Tupac episode as well. But I feel like you were saying that this episode, more than ever, it's like everyone's got a nickname. It's nicknames on nicknames on nicknames in this episode. I'm pretty sure that like a good 80% of what I'm going to be saying tonight is people's nicknames. <laughs> like everybody has a nickname. Like I just, I mean, at least with Tupac, Tupac was his name. Yeah. So it's like, well, there was that. But it's yeah. like everybody's got a name and then it's like you got to pick one name to go by. So it's the same throughout your notes, whereas my notes have them listed as different things depending on what source I got it from. So, oy. but the point is nicknames upon nicknames. They're just always there. So there's going to be a lot coming out. It's my point. I can't wait. I also, I did watch, I mean, I did uh, literally 0.0001% of the research Christy did. I watched one documentary, uh, the new one on Netflix, Biggie, I Got a Story to Tell. And there is a moment where he's being interviewed and he somebody calls him Biggie Smalls. And he's like, nope, we don't use that one anymore. I might get sued. We've changed it to the Notorious B.I.G., which I thought was amazing that uh, yeah. I guess somebody else had Biggie Smalls. Who knew? Yeah. Well, we're you. all about to find out. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, listen, I'm getting ahead of myself. The point being, nicknames, uh, well, a couple of things. First of yeah. all, um, I remember you as a kid, your immediate family had yeah. a specific nickname for you. That is correct. And I, mean, I was always uh, jealous because I always wanted a nickname and I never really got one. Well, at that point I mean, in my life. My, I mean, it's, it's as cute as you want to make it, I guess. I mean, I have never had a problem with it. Looking back on it, if you want to like, therapist to analyze it i mean of course it was, i do it was me um as like a toddler unable to say my own name oh i didn't so, know that was the origin story um yes so as a child and 
sometimes to this day, it depends on uh, who it is and the moment in time, I think. Um, but I have been known to be called Crick uh, because when I was quite, quite young, um, they would ask me my name and I would say my name is Cricky because I couldn't say Christy properly. It's difficult. Give me a break. Um, I was an adorable child. And at some point, if I could just feel the need to post a photo of myself when I was like two, ooh, I was we all need a it. Very adorable child. We all want it. Um, but uh, yeah, so over the years, I mean, sometimes people for some reason like stretched it out and I was called Cricket for a while, which was weird. But Crick seems to be the usual. Well, here's a little side story for you about your own nickname. Um, Can't wait. There was a character on The Young and the Restless, I believe. Okay. And her nickname, the character's nickname was Cricket. And I remember as a little kid being around you and your family and your, your family would call you Cricket. And, and Grandma told me that it was because of The Young and the Restless Cricket. That's Is what it? I thought. It may not be, but... <laughs> That's what she thought that that's what she either knew or assumed. So that's what I thought. I had no idea that this was about a mispronunciation of your own name. I had no idea. <laughs> well, no idea. Well, now I want to know what was the character's actual name? Because if her name was if the character's name was Christy, I've been lied to my whole life. I think it I think it was. I thought that that was what it was, was there was a character named Christy. Her name was Cricket. And that's why they were calling you Cricket. That's what I thought. But I, again, we could be wrong. But aside from like grandparents maybe who in our family watched young and the restless i did go through a phase <laughs> uh about a decade was it young and the restless when i i texted you one day this was a few years ago where i was like so i've decided to pick up a soap opera and then i texted you the whole episode being like i don't know what's going on this is ridiculous and then like three days go by and i was like can you believe that steve has the nerve to come back after what he did to marjorie and like I was so into it and so passionate because you have to just drop in and enjoy it. I mean, yeah. I had, I've had moments of like days of our lives. Yeah. Back when Jensen Ackles was on there. <laughs> Shout out to Jensen Thank you very Ackles. much. Friend of the podcast. Who doesn't um, know he's a friend of the podcast? Correct. Um, well, our grandfather, uh, he was obsessed with Young and the Restless. Right. Obsessed. Yeah. And he would try and retell the stories but he wouldn't know any of the character names. So he'd be like, well, the blonde woman would do blah, blah, blah. And it's like, there's eight blondes. All the blonde. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. know what to tell you. Yeah. Um, anyway, well, listen, food for thought. I'm just, I mean, who knows? Now I feel like I have to look into this. I mean, I did, I feel like I briefly tried Young and the Restless at one point. At one, I did go through a deep general hospital phase. Mm. And Bold and the Beautiful. Oh my God, am I a soapy? Is that what they You call? might be. You might be. I need to pick it up again. I need time because my current time, the only time I allot myself every evening, my husband and I watch a movie or a show of some kind to catch up on shows. And then every day at lunch, if I'm not watching a documentary at the time, which I then call a working lunch because I'm a nerd, um, if I'm not already watching one, I will then uh, treat myself to an episode of Night Court. <laughs> That's right. Now, listen, if you've been listening yeah. to the show for any amount of time, you probably know that Christy is rewatching Night Court. If you haven't, you're hearing it now for the first time. And I really love getting the updates because we've I've been getting updates. And I loved Night Court as a kid, which is inspiring yeah. me that I feel like I need to rewatch it as well. It's interesting. Like, there's a lot yeah. of like, ooh, couldn't get that made now. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of questionable stuff that goes on. But overall, it's like, well. I love them. I will say this. My biggest complaint, I'm only in season three right now. I believe it's got se nine seasons and I'm watching them one a day at lunch. That's my 24 hour break. Uh, it's uh, our 24 minute break rather, which sounds very sad when you say it out loud. Um, but my big complaint, there's a, there's a court stenographer mm -hmm. that sits right in front of the bench She's not part of the gang. She's not a character that has talking parts. She's She just sits there. Like, every once in a while, they'll ask her. But it's like every, like, 10 episodes, she gets one line. And it's like, how is she not somebody that joins them? Like, if if the attorneys and the court clerk and the judge and the bailiffs are all going for lunch together, why are they not bringing uh, the stenographer? 
My dream is a spinoff show about the stenographer. She's secretly a killer, so she doesn't hang out with them all the time. And on her downtime, she's committing murders. I mean, that's what I want to see. I mean, look, that's a dream. My dream was a new night court where you're the judge. See, and that also would be a dream. And Dan is still a lawyer. And it, he was very, I don't know, about a young judge at the beginning of Night Court. So right. the idea of coming in and being like a young judge and she's a woman, like he's just, he would, his brain would implode. And I would like to see that. Listen, I got to send some emails. I got to make yeah. some calls, but we're going to get on it. And I'm going to pursue my stenographer idea as well. Yes. Um, now, again, very quickly before we get into it, uh, we should also reveal that we have nicknames for each other that we've never talked about on the show before. And yeah. these are the kinds of things people want to hear. The fan artists that we have, we have amazing fan artists that listen. And I feel like this is going to open them up right away into some options. So I think I gave us both of these nicknames, didn't I? I, I and also, like, yeah. can, you, can you give yourself a nickname, Lauren? I've always wanted a nickname, okay? Uh, this is I mean, a yeah, I mean, I guess real misstep on my part uh, for no! not ever giving you a nickname. I think the only nickname, like, I've nicknamed my own children, but that's just for the pure sake of having something quicker to yell. Um, sure, sure. And then my husband and I have nicknames for each other. True joke. We, we share nicknames. <laughs> we have the same huh. nickname. We just say the same thing back and forth to each other. Right. Um, it works. We're adorable. Uh, but uh, yeah, I my memory of you giving us these nicknames is that I had gone to see you, but yep. it was at a time, I think I had the week off school. Like it was like a spring break situation for me, but not for you because you had to go to school. Yeah. And I woke up to a note you'd left me where you gave me a nickname and signed a nickname for yourself. That so is it. You essentially did it in one note. I, God, I hope I have that somewhere. I hope you do too. It but I'm also great. realizing at first it seemed like you just kind of like made up names, but now I'm thinking you knew Blanche was there. <laughs> like my nickname is a little, my nickname's a little more, yeah, at the time though, that wasn't a thing. I should, no. in my defense, no, no it was not. No. It was not. So the nicknames, drum roll, please. Thank you so much, everyone listening. Of course, Christy was and is the lovable eggplant, and I am the zany pork chop. And that's, you know, we we shortened them yeah. for years. Obviously, we shortened them down. Like we weren't using our full official titles. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but that, that, those were the nicknames that day in that note that just stuck, that just stuck. And that's been nice. I've had a couple of other nicknames. There's a certain group of people that'll call me Lola and I like Lola. That's nice. Yeah. It's a nice nickname. And then there's been some nicknames that like, you know, ex-boyfriends have called me and then it's like, I like the nickname, but now it's burned. It's dead. You know, I can't use it again. So that sucks. I mean, look, if you want me to start working on something. I mean, Some, just something that's not pork chop. I mean, I like I'm, pork chop. I'm gonna say this now. Okay. I'm if if those nicknames had happened and we had been a little bit older, I probably would have been like, well, now I need an eggplant tattoo, and thank <laughs> God. Because who would have known that in years to come there would have been known. something called iPhones that would come out, and the eggplant would have taken on a whole new meaning. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have been given so many kitchen eggplant items over the years i don't believe any by you my mother likes to find something that you know people like and likes to gift it and that's very sweet uh but a lot of a lot of eggplant things i do believe there is an eggplant i love it i do believe it's my own kitchen and i'm like i'm pretty sure uh that there's an eggplant picture in my kitchen somewhere i think you're right like the other thing I just want to say is that I didn't think about it at the time, but yeah. now I'm realizing, and if we want to therapy it, think about this. I love eggplant. Like eggplant Parmesan is probably one of my favorite things in the world. And I gave you that name subconsciously. And I hate pork chops. <laughs> no, I'm not saying I hate myself. I don't. I love myself very much. But it's just funny to me that I, I picked seemingly at random and I chose something for you that I really love and I chose something for me that I refuse to eat. 
I mean, I don't even think I need the therapist hat here. Yeah, you don't. There's also something to be said if you want to dive further into uh, the adjective lovable versus zany. Oh my God, you're right. Where it's like, you could not put enough love on this one. Where it's like, where is this goof off over here? I mean... I got to make some more calls and send some more emails, but they're to somebody else. You know what I mean? Hello. Yeah. I mean, do, <laughs> <Doctor>? I, <laughs> do, do I want to see a little cartoon of us in pork chop and eggplant suits? The answer is yes. <laughs> We're not asking directly, no. but we are. So thank no. you so much in advance. You all, you're the best fans. <laughs> truly. You are the best fans in the world. So yes, that's a hundred percent, but. Um, yeah, anyway, fan art is amazing. Um, so there you go. You've learned a little bit more about us. Christy's learned a little bit more about her cricket nickname, and she didn't even know. I mean, I again, I could be wrong. That's just the story I was always told. Um, but on that note, I think we should get into it because we got lots to get through, and I cannot wait. Uh, so again, we're going to be talking about Notorious B.I.G. I, got, I just got to tell you, that these margaritas are hitting hard. And as you know, even if I'm not drunk, but I have a little bit of liquor in me, it's very hard for me to read. So do you want me in. to read? Do you want me to read? <laughs> no, no, I can do it. I can do it. I'm trying then to, I'm trying this to is the last you. thing that I have to do. Like, this is my time to shine. And then the rest of it is you. So, so listen, let me do, yeah. let me yeah. at least oh, do a little right, bit of right. heavy lifting. Let me help. Let me stir this batter and then you'll make the muffins. Okay. <laughs> oh God. You're going to be great. Here we go. <clears throat> All right. After attending an awards show after party, hip hop superstore, the notorious B I G was killed in a drive by shooting at just 24 years old in the more than two decades since police have still not made a single arrest in the case, despite having numerous suspects. What really happened to Biggie? Was his death a result of the East Coast, West Coast rap feud or possible retaliation for the death of Tupac just months before? Or have the police not made any arrests because they're protecting one of their own? I almost got through the whole thing. This I is also, these are getting so well written, it's almost criminal. Just got to tell you. I mean, they've always have been, but well done. Thank you. Um, I feel like early Christy was like, give them the facts, ma'am. And now Christy is like, tease him, you bitch. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You've gone from MSNBC to CNN. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Fun fact, CNN, um, in one of the Biggie documentaries that I watched, they showed clips on different, like, um, reporters talking about the case and one of them was a very adorable very young anderson cooper oh that's I nice would not have been more excited it was like seeing an old friend i was really hoping you were gonna say don lemon but again for people who don't know <laughs> that are listening i love don lemon so much look we just want it out in the world I just don don lemon knows there. that we love him yeah. and if 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 he wants to talk about his book we're a safe space we're a safe space. I've already pre-ordered the book. I pre-ordered his book. And then I found out that if you went through like his own website or something, you could get a signed copy. And I was like, well, guess I'm getting two. <laughs> <laughs> I love that as soon as you say, if you go through his website, then I was like, oh, so I should get her one. It's going to be, the, it's going to be the Biff Naked book all over again. Oh yes. That's so true. Yeah. Biff Naked, for those who don't know, is a, an iconic Canadian uh, performer um, she's just amazing. She wrote an amazing book. Uh, and, and yes, I, we met her actually, um, in Vancouver, we went to a book signing she was doing and she was so lovely. Oh, yeah. I, I just adore her. All right, but let's get into it. Notorious B.I.G. Here we go. We're talking about uh, a little gentleman who was born, not Notorious B.I.G. He was born Christopher Wallace. Wasn't he? He was, <laughs> uh, I'm going to say it in case I forget. I feel like I put a little too much in that drink because suddenly, although I'm also wondering if I'm getting a little bit of swagger based on the subject matter. You do get a little bit, you get you you do get a certain kind of swag to you mm -hmm. when you when you're talking about the rappers. I know that we we all know how much you you love Ice Cube, for example. And and uh the last the Tupac episode, you definitely brought a little energy to it. So I can't wait to see what happens. Yeah, look, and I know last week 
was it just last week? I don't know. Um, we talked about uh, if I mention somebody I'm attracted to, you were going to pull out an envelope. Yeah. I'm not saying that there need to be envelopes today, but I'm just saying, God, I, I bet there's a stack. <laughs> you know what? I didn't do envelopes this time. And, and, and the reason being was I couldn't keep up. That's, I was like, there's just so many possibilities fair. for Blanche. That's, that's fair. Um, off the top of my head, I think three. Huh. That, oh, like, shoot. I should have done them. That was so distracting that at one point I got in a very heated argument with myself about, which is a whole other thing. Uh, but yeah, just, I did, uh, we will mention this um, on Instagram. I did watch the uh, Biggie, I Got a Story to Tell, which just came out on Netflix. Uh, Biggie, The Life of Notorious B.I.G., which is a 2017 biography documentary. Biggie and Tupac, a, 20, a 2002 documentary. And then I didn't watch it again because I watched it for the Tupac episode. There is murder rap inside the Biggie and Tupac murders from 2015. Um, there's also a couple of books in there, one of which... I will mention them both later. One, um, I did not write it out for Lauren because I would like to surprise her, has the oh. longest title known to man. I can't wait. It's outrageous. I cannot believe an editor was like, yeah, that'll be, that'll fly. Um, so are, are we ready? Okay, I'm ready, but I just want you to know. Yeah. You said it's outrageous and I stopped myself because I almost said, but was it? trout rages i am extremely intoxicated <laughs> 26 minutes into this this yep. does not yep. bode well i no. apologize now uh i just want to say thank you everyone and good night <laughs> business lauren is checking out and party ash is in the house so oh. uh let's get into it here we go all right christopher wallace we take okay. you there <laughs> first of all never apologize for being yourself you're gonna be Thank great. You. This is what the people are here for. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna go to Christopher Wallace, but we're gonna take a slight skip back a little bit to Valletta Wallace, born February third, nineteen fifty three, in Trelawney, Jamaica. In the mid nineteen sixties, Valletta moved to New York for the sake of education and to make a better life for herself. A few years go by and Valletta meets Selwyn George Latour, a welder and politician. At the time, Valletta is a preschool teacher. Valletta discovers that she's pregnant in 1971. She tells her friends and they say, oh, did Selwyn not tell you that he's married? <laughs> oh, God. Consider this foreshadowing to Selwyn being a shitty person. <laughs> so uh, May 21st. 1972, Valletta gave birth to Christopher George Latour Wallace. While that main name may not sound familiar, Christopher would later go, go on to use the names Biggie Smalls, Frank White, and the Notorious B.I.G. And to spare any confusion, I'm just going to call him Biggie for the rest of this. It feels right. I know I will get into why he's not Biggie Smalls, uh, but he's just, he's Biggie. He's just always going to be Biggie, you know? Um, so to this day, Biggie is considered to be one of the greatest rappers of all time. He was known for his distinctive laid back lyrical delivery, as well as his six foot two, nearly 400 pound frame. Biggie was said to be sincere, loving, generous, kind, shy, and quiet, which I find interesting for someone that I've been, uh, listening to, uh, a few of his albums while doing some research. I did with Tupac, so I felt like I should, uh, of course, in this way. And uh, he really just talks about pounding those hoes, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, it's just shocking. Uh, you mean pounding in the I sexual mean, sense, or I pounding mean, in the the domestic violence sense? I mean, ninety eight percent is sexual. Great, and I think that could be said for most of his stuff. I mean he doesn't ever say like i want to beat her it's he wants okay. to ki he wants to kill her and like fuck her and whatever okay uh but like it just depends but we'll get into we'll get into the of stuff course. where i'm like oof i love him so much right there uh but he was a complicated character but we'll get into that as well 
So uh, when Christopher is less than two years old, his father Selwyn walks and doesn't come back. Valletta then works two jobs during the day and attends school at night, all while raising Christopher on her own. Not only is she an incredibly strong woman, she's also possibly the cutest human being alive, and I'm pretty sure she's my favorite person in this entire storyline. I'm aware this is real, but in my head, it's like, that's a fun story, and she's my favorite character. Um, She was interviewed about a documentary that she was part of, and her quote was, yeah, they let me yap a little bit. The term yap was just very endearing. I like it. So Christopher and his, mo- and his mother uh, had a very strong relationship. Um, they, oh, Jesus. Uh, everyone who knew him said he was completely devoted to her and he called her daily. Uh, she also does have a very solid impression of him, which is amazing because she will like really lower her voice uh, to do his voice. And it is hilarious and adorable. Uh, Valletta raised Biggie in a brownstone near the corner of St. James Place and Fulton Street in Clinton Hill, Brooklyn. Biggie attended Catholic school for the first six years, and Valletta instilled an early love of music in Biggie, forcing him to listen to her favorite country music because, as she said, quote, he had no other choice. (laughs) Valletta would save uh, throughout the year so she could take Biggie to Jamaica every summer where he became fascinated by the reggae music that his uncles would perform. So if country and reggae weren't enough to get him an interest in music, along comes a close relationship he has with a neighbor and saxophonist named Donald Harrison, who was considered a master of every era of jazz, soul, funk, and a composer of classical music. Harrison took Biggie to the movies, to the Museum of Modern Art, and had hopes to groom Biggie to become a jazz musician. However, friends introduced Biggie to drugs, which led him to becoming a dealer at the ripe old age of 13. Wow. But he would never forget his love of music, and he began rapping in his early teens, making his first recording at just 14 years old. He sampled Toto's Africa, uh, using the name using the name MC Quest uh, at a recording studio in Brooklyn called Funky Slice. So by the time Biggie's like 16, 17, he's making like six, seven grand a week selling crack. And his mother would not find out about this until after his death. And her quote was, if he wasn't dead, I would have killed him. <laughs> uh, there was an incident where he left a plate of drugs drying in his room and Valletta went in to clean up. She was grossed out by what she thought was a plate of old mashed potatoes, threw it out. Turns out it was a plate of crack, <laughs> which is also somehow very pure and innocent, I find. Um, I also would not know what a plate of crack looked like. Oh, me so, neither. You know, Um Uh, So at this point, Biggie's making good money selling drugs. He sees no need for school. He drops out by the age of 17. In 1989, he's arrested on a weapons charge in Brooklyn, sentenced to five years probation. In 1990, he violates that probation and gets arrested again. A year later, he's arrested in North Carolina, where he spends nine months in jail after pleading guilty to three counts of drug possession. Now... Now we're going to get to Blanche is coming out. (laughs) Yes! Because I was very taken by this gentleman right away. In 1991, Damien Butler, a.k.a. D-Rock, was living in the same neighborhood as DJ producer 50 Grand. D-Rock brings Biggie to the neighborhood where he has a rap battle with a guy named Supreme, who was apparently the uh, king of the neighborhood, like the top MC of his neighborhood. Well, Biggie came in and crushed it. And 50 grand was like, we need to make a demo immediately. Uh, However, uh, Biggie had made this trip to North Carolina and kind of got himself arrested. So he had to wait till after he got out of jail to make that demo. He made the demo in the name Biggie Smalls after a character in the 1975 movie, Let's Do It Again. 
So 50 grand, Biggie Smalls, record a four demo, four song demo in the basement of the pool room. Songs included Guaranteed Raw, Live in Action, and Love No Ho. Hmm. Uh, the main demo was Microphone Murderer, which was used, uh, which used the sample that 50 grand had used on Big Daddy Kane's Ain't No Half Steppin'. I never feel right when I don't put a G on the end of a word. Ain't no half stepping. Look, that's what it's called. I'm, I I'm, like it. I'm doing my I best like to it. stay true to the research. You know, I have to just say very quickly. Yeah. We're already going off the rails. No, party please. Ash. Party Ash is here. Like um, no, the one thing I was remarking about when I was watching that documentary, just going back very quickly to, to the drugs and the charges and Valletta, yeah. she was like such a strong force in his life. And everyone talked about how she was like always like, you know, Christopher, where are you? Christopher, come home. Like she mm -hmm. was such an active uh, parent from the, from the, you know, the way it looked at least. Yes. And it felt like she really gave him a good life. Like she worked hard to like keep him in Catholic school, you know, and I don't know then what the deal was. I assume that it was, it's not private school, but often with Catholic schools, you have to pay something for, for, it's not like a pure public school. Sure. I could be wrong, but you know, that's my knowledge of it anyway. So it was interesting to me that he got into drug dealing so easily. I, and I understand like, like meaning only that I feel like some of the stories that you hear of people, it's like, well, you know, we were really, really struggling or, you know, I had absent parents. Now I understand he had an absent father, but it was just interesting to me that he went down that path because it was, he was so close to his mother. He, they had a great relationship. She was very involved in his life. It felt like she was doing everything she could to provide for him and to try and keep him away from that path. And he still went down that path. I just thought that was like an interesting thing. Um, agreed. Uh, the only thing I can think of is, I mean, at the time she was doing two jobs of during the day mm. plus she was doing school at night so he was probably full latchkey kid where he was I home see. on his own quite a lot and kudos to her that like anytime she wasn't working obviously she spent quite a lot of quality time with him that they would grow this you know quality relationship i don't know i didn't mean quality uh, she spent the quality time for their close relationship I meant something along those lines. I get what Point you mean. Point is, but I, I see what you're saying. He was working a lot. And so I think gotcha. he probably spent a lot of time at home. And then, I mean, when you're a kid and friends are like, hey, look at this. And then also like the comment was made that one week, he went one week from asking his mom for like ice cream money to the next week making like thousands of dollars. Isn't that wild? So it's like, I could see it easily being like, oh, wow. Then I just buy whatever the hell I want. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. I can see once it gets started that it's like, oh, I'm not giving this up. Yeah. I'm making thousands and thousands of dollars. I just thought it was was interesting. But yeah. no, you're right. I guess also in order to provide him with that life, she would have had to work a ton. He was probably a latchkey kid and or hanging out with his friends. And, you know, yeah. when I think back, not that I was dipping my toe in any sort of drug dealing or or even drug doing. But, yes, mm -hmm. I hear you that I, you know, you get you get up to your own devices with your friends when you're uh, when you're left to your to your own devices with them. Um, yes. But that's so interesting. It's so interesting. I, I just found that part of the story very interesting. And she was yeah. my favorite part of this story too, for the record. Yes. Um, also, I just want to point out, we aren't saying like sell drugs because there was oh. that moment where we're like, you get so much money. <laughs> you barely have to work. Like it, we weren't trying to make a, an ad for, uh, of course not. I'm saying no. that I understand given his, you know, for his, in the context of his story, yeah, I get it. Like, but yeah, no, yeah, not I, at all. I had no idea any of this about him. Like if you had asked no, me, me before neither. I looked into Tupac, it was like, I knew that he died in some sort of drive-by, but that was about where my, where my knowledge ended. When I uh, did all of the Tupac research, I got a little bit of a peek on the inside. And then this, I got a further peek because I wanted to go further into background because I didn't know a lot. So yeah. Oh, I, I love it. If I don't know a lot, well, I'm going to find out and I'm going to force y'all to listen. I love it. That's what we're I love for. it. All right. So he's released the four song demo. Yeah. Uh, 50 grand uh, passes this demo on to Big Daddy Kane's DJ, Mr. C, who said it was unlike anything he'd ever heard before. So he passed it on to Mateo Capiluongo. Sorry, Mateo. Um, AKA Maddie C. Again, they all go by something else. 
Um, Maddie C worked for Source Magazine. At the time, the Source was considered like um, the Rolling Stone of hip hop magazine. Um, so each month they ran an article called Unsigned Hype uh, that was dedicated to the featuring up and coming rappers. And after hearing the demo, the Source featured Biggie Smalls in the March 1992 issue. Unsigned Hype is, I already went there, so sorry. So Unsigned Hype episode or the article comes out who sees this but a young concert promoter who also happens to be in the a and department at uptown records a one mr sean combs mm -hmm. now sean goes by a lot of names he was puffy then he was puff daddy then he was p diddy then he was just diddy for the sake of consistency i'm just gonna call him puffy and my reason for that is because I learned where Puffy came from when he was a child, he would get real, anytime he would be really, really mad, he would huff and puff. And so they started calling him Puffy. And I find that hysterical. So Puffy it is. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So Puffy sees the article. He reaches out to the source to hear the demo and is so impressed, arranges to meet Biggie and then just immediately signs him to Uptown Records. Biggie then uh, appeared on songs by Heavy D. I think he did one with Mary J. Blige at one point. Less than a year later, Puffy is let go from Uptown Records for apparently having a bit of an ego, if you can believe that. Uh, <laughs> so Puffy launches his own label called Bad Boy Records in 1993 with the first act to sign on, none other than Biggie Smalls. However... At the time, Biggie was receiving cease and desist letters from an artist who had been using the name Biggie Smalls since 1991. Now, the only difference between the original Biggie Smalls and Chris Wallace Biggie, Biggie Smalls is the original Biggie Smalls, Biggie has a Y at the end and a Z at the end of small, whereas... Uh, Biggie, we know he is Biggie with an I E at the end and small with or smalls with an S. Yes. So we go to Biggie with a Y. Born Tim Bigelow in 1979, Biggie Smalls is listed as a white slash Latino rapper from West Coast who started recording music when he was 12 years old. Wow. Uh, when the Biggie we know loved, uh, at, the Biggie we know and loved dropped an album, fans got confused and bought the White Kids album instead. Can you imagine? <laughs> it would be pretty amazing to get home yes. and be like, yes, I love it when you call me big. What is this? Yes. I just kind of figured it was more like Nana was at the store and was like, you know what? he would love that new Biggie Smalls album. And they're like, oh, here you go. You know, or she just misread or, you know, I love that I put it on grandmas. Grandmas are pure. They've done nothing wrong. They do their best. Um, so uh, I'm sure some of those kids loved the hits Cruisin' and Nobody Rides for Free, but I also highly doubt it. Yeah. Um, despite winning a lawsuit against Biggie to be able to use the name Biggie Smalls, Tim Bigelow ended up changing his name to Shadow and Shadowcast in 1994 due to confusion. He released four singles as Biggie and one EP as Shadow and is currently working IT somewhere in California. <laughs> That's about the best I can find. I will post a picture. I found like a headshot. It's pretty great. <laughs> and not at all the notorious B.I.G. Biggie Smalls you would be expecting. Oh, I love uh, this. So with Biggie Smalls off the table, Biggie officially chose the name, the Notorious B.I.G. He had been called uh, Biggie pretty much since the age of 10 because he was a bit of a chunky child from that age. So people just always called him Big or Biggie. And uh, I, I get it. I was, I was stick thin until I was like nine. And then it just... It was all over for me. <laughs> That's not the point. I want you to know that I went through a very chubby phase. And some of speaking of nicknames, some of the neighborhood kids started calling me Miss Piggy. Uh, that stuck. That nickname stuck. Um, and then some other kids used to make the sound of the earth breaking as I would step. 
I wasn't even that big. No, this is about, this is about something else. I'm going to start Look, going into patriarchy and body image, and then we're going to be 45 minutes down the road and we can't risk it. But all I'm saying is sometimes nicknames hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. But Miss Piggy's also amazing, by the way. So now I own it and I'm like, oh I would love God. to be like her. So her, y'all can go to hell. Her level of sass. And she is a strong female figure. Yes. She doesn't need no man. She wants one. Yep. Kermit you know? specifically. Yeah. She's not a Blanche, but, or she is, but only for one. It's for just, frogs. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that's where we're at now. Yep. Um, I can't. No, no, I was going to go into a whole thing about Miss Piggy's <laughs> Tinder profile, but I can't. <laughs> Oh my gosh, we need to make one of those. Yeah. 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 In short, yes. Yes. Yes, we do. Yes. We're also like dancing around the fact that we're trying to pretend right now in this moment that you and I weren't texting about Muppet Babies for like a good, good hour earlier today. Yeah. We can't get into it. There's no time. There's a no. new Sam, Sam the Eagle, baby Sam the Eagle, and I am dead is all I'm going to say. It, he's so cute. He's adorable. So cute. All right. So, okay. So the other Biggie Smalls, he changed to Shadow. And he works in IT now. Yeah. Bring us back to, to Biggie, 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 can't you yeah. see? So uh, during all of this, Biggie's personal life went on a bit of a roller coaster ride. Mm. So in 1992, one of Biggie's closest friends since childhood, Roland Ole Young, was shot and killed by his own uncle in a bodega. The incident shook Biggie as he was supposed to be with Oli at the time of the shooting. Oli had always pushed and encouraged Biggie to pursue music. Oh. So later that year, Biggie and his longtime, longtime girlfriend Jan Jackson broke up only to find out that she was pregnant at the time. Jan gave birth to their daughter, Tiana Dream Wallace, August 8th, 1993. Now that Biggie's a father, he was ready to truly make something of himself. He decided to keep dealing drugs to ensure that his daughter would have everything she would need. But when Puffy heard about the drugs, he was pissed because Puffy's father was a drug dealer who got murdered at the age of 33 when Puffy was just a toddler. So Puffy said when it came to the world of drugs, he learned early in life that there's only two ways out of that. So Biggie would later say that Puffy's following Puffy's advice is what saved him. Huh. In April 1994, Biggie had his first solo track, Party and Bullshit, released on a soundtrack for the movie Who's the Man. The track got Biggie a lot of attention, especially, especially from a well-known rapper who Blanche is a very large fan of, one Mr. Tupac Shakur. Oh, there it is. Uh, after hearing the track, Tupac reached out and the pair became close friends almost immediately. We'll get more into that bromance later. Uh, so July 94, uh, Biggie went to a photo shoot for the talent uh, at Bad Boy Records, where he meets fellow Bad Boy artist Faith Evans. Biggie said when he saw her, uh, her uh, she was killing me with those eyes. I rolled up to her and was like, you're the type of girl I would marry. She said, why don't you? So I was like, fuck it. It's on. So after that beautiful proposal, <laughs> who could say no? And August 4th, 1994, Biggie and Faith Evans were married just nine days after they met. Shut up. Yeah. Believe it or not, it didn't work out, but we'll uh -huh. get into that. <laughs> yeah. huh. Weird. Yeah. So uh, September 13th, 1994, Biggie's debut album, Ready to Die, dropped to rave reviews, featuring signature songs, Juicy and Big Papa. Come on, Big Papa. Yep. Um, Ready to Die put the East Coast back on the map in the world of hip hop, because for years, West Coast was where it was at as far as hip hop goes. They were dominating the scene. Biggie came along and he made himself the central figure in East Coast hip hop. So it seemed like everyone loved this album. That is everyone except for his mother, Valletta, who listened to it once and complained to Biggie about the profanity to which Biggie said, quote, 
what are you doing listening to my music? It's not for anyone over 35 years old. Oh, which God, made, I feel I, very attacked. Uh, yes. I mean, at the time we were not 35 years old, but sure. also at the time, again, when I think back to this happening and to like remembering that he was shot in my head, he was like in his thirties. I didn't realize he was quite young when he, he was died. So, so, so I know I didn't, I thought with Tupac too, I was like 25. Like that's so it's, it's insane. And like at the time, um, Puffy was about the same age and those who listen to the Tupac episode know I have a few issues with Puffy and it embarrasses me to say this, but he really grew into his own, didn't he? <laughs> nope. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you saying that your theories and hunches about Puffy have been pushed aside by Blanche? <laughs> no. Blanche knows. Blanche knows what he is. But Blanche can't. Blanche, <laughs> Blanche has to. Blanche is be Blanche. Well, listen, I guess I should also just very quickly say if anyone's listening to us for the first time or you're new to us, Christie's yeah. alter ego is Blanche in reference to the Golden Girls Blanche in that Blanche is like men. Yeah. And Blanche is be Blanching. So anyway, that's just a little, yeah. a I, little uh, I have explanation. Always, I've always had n- just so many crushes without even meaning to. I can't stop myself. I don't know what my problem is. Happily married. But happily, you know, happily. Uh, so despite Valletta's feelings on the album, it would later be certified four times platinum. Wow. Now, I will say I did listen to the two of his albums. There are multiple that were released posthumously. Uh, but I just wanted to hear the album because I the albums that were released in his lifetime because I knew that's how he wanted it to sound. Right. The weird way of putting it. But the point is, I, I think I think in the end, I think I liked the uh, I think I liked Ready to Die better. Although my favorite song of his was on the next one. And we'll get into that because that shit's my jam. <laughs> I don't know what's happening to me. Uh, so at this point, Biggie is riding high with his sudden success and he's working on new stuff at Quad Studio in November 1994. With him, as always, is Puffy and two members of the Junior Mafia, which Mafia stands for Masters at Finding Intelligent Attitudes. Uh, They're a group of Biggie's childhood friends that he brought together with the thought that once he made it, he was going to try and have his friend help his friends make it. There's just so much love and like want for your friends to be successful within this group of friends. It's just a really beautiful thing to see. So the group included nine members, um, including Lil' Kim, Nino Brown, and here we go, folks, one of Blanche's favorite people in this whole thing, Lil' Cease. Uh, Wow. Yeah, I was quite taken with him. He had a very loving relationship with Biggie. There was just such a bro thing. They were also apparently cousins. Oh, um, but Valletta referred to him as Christopher's heart. Oh, wow. Yeah. There was also a part in the documentary, which I loved very much, um, where these, I can't remember which documentary, it doesn't matter at this point, uh, where the, the interviewer was like, I want to speak to these people. I've reached out to them, but they don't want to talk to me. So Valletta picks up a phone and just goes, hi, it's Miss Wallace. Okay, thank you. And hangs up and suddenly walking through the door they walk through the door they do like a you know hey to biggie's ashes that are there then they like kiss miss wallace because of course they're checking up on her and i truly believe this isn't in my notes this is in my soul i believe (laughs) i believe that when he died she was the rock that held them all together Oh, that's beautiful. I truly believe it because she is such a strong woman. I yeah. think she was, she just never allowed herself to fall apart because she had to take care of all of her other sons, uh, which is beautiful. And I can't get into it. So not biological sons for the record. No, these, correct. These correct. You know, she took best on, friends. Sons. She took on um, mothering these other essentially kids because they were i mean they were early 20s but the point is i'd call that a kid i'd call it a kid she was uh she was the rock and i stand by it 
Uh, so Lil Mafia, or sorry, Junior Mafia, uh, would disband shortly after Biggie's death, and then they reunited in 2005 for an album, but okay. Mm. Uh, so Quad Studios, you got Biggie, you got Puffy, you got Nino Brown, and Little Cease. Now, Little Cease is Biggie's cousin, James Lloyd. So Nino and Little Cease are on the balcony smoking. They look down, they see Tupac on the street. They yell down to him. They're like, hey, come on up. We'll be right down. They go back into the studio. They're like, hey, big Tupac's down there. He's like, yeah, go get him. They go in the elevator. As they're getting to the floor, they hear gunshots. The elevator doors open. A gunman gets in their face and goes, just get back inside and leave. They come back upstairs. They tell Biggie what's going on. Police are called. Um... Tupac, they, these three gunmen had robbed Tupac of $40,000 worth of gold chains and a ring and shot him five times, including twice in the head. Physically, Tupac survives the attack, but mentally, it leaves him feeling paranoid and makes him wonder if Biggie knew about the ambush and just didn't warn him. What doesn't help the situation is that three months later, Biggie released a song called Who Shot Ya? Yeah, why? I know. So shortly after the incident, Tupac goes to prison on assault charges. And while there, uh, ends up signing a record deal with Suge Knight of Death Row Records. So once again, Biggie's life becomes a roller coaster. His constant, just constant infidelity has caused Biggie and Faith to separate. Mm. after one particularly awful moment when faith catches biggie at a hotel with another woman and not only that when she knocks on the door the other woman answers the door buck ass naked so of course faith smacked her around flew home and then immediately moved out of their house then 1995 billboard music awards give biggie the honor of rapper of the year August, the Source Awards, Biggie picks up Best New Solo Artist, Lyricist of the Year, Live Performer of the Year, and then Ready to Die won Album of the Year. While picking up the awards, Biggie was also picking up felony charges, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) such as uh, counts on weapons possession in New York after threatening two fans uh, who'd asked him for an autograph. Not just that, he chased them down, smashed the windows of their cab, punched one of them, and said he would kill them. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but no worries. He pleaded guilty to a second-degree harassment charge and was only given 100 hours of community service. He would later be arrested for drug and weapons possession in his home in New Jersey. We're getting there, people. We're getting there. So, uh, Biggie also... Uh, Get, got picked up in New Jersey for robbery and assault. And then in 1996, picked up for another assault charge in New York, along with a couple of weapons possession charges. Biggie manages to have his on and off again relationship with Faith back on again until he starts an affair with Lil' Kim. Faith. I know. Faith. You We've can't... all been there, Faith, but they're not going to change Faith. You can't help who you love. I'm not defending him. I'm just saying. I'm so, you're defending her. I understand. I, I just uh, want the best yeah. for Faith. I know. Well, maybe she has it now, but oof. Does she? I don't, uh, it's We're going to have to look into it. Yeah. Uh, so at first, Biggie hid the fact that he was cheating on Faith by asking Faith to mentor little Kim to help her with her confidence as well as her image. But if she's fucking your man, behind your back and has the balls to act like she isn't to your face her confidence is fine biggie (laughs) she passed that test flying colors she's fine uh but of course faith found out about the affair and when biggie put together a tour of bad boy acts and asked faith to join she said hell no instead she went to la and then was introduced to tupac and agreed to make a song with him Now, at this point, the East Coast, West Coast hip hop rivalry was fierce. Shug dissed Puffy openly at the Source Awards. 
Two weeks later, Puffy's bodyguard allegedly shot and killed Shug's best friend, Jake Robles. And with Tupac thinking that Biggie was in on the quad shooting, it was well known that there was a lot of bad blood in the group. However, Faith claims she didn't realize that Biggie and Tupac had a rivalry at all, uh, which feels like really hard to miss when like a chubby white girl in Saskatchewan knew about it, (laughs) but someone married to one of them did not. But again, she didn't know. She didn't know. Um, But I don't blame her uh, for not realizing Tupac wanted to use their collaboration as something to throw in Biggie's face. After they recorded together, Tupac released a new track called Hit Him Up, in which he talks smack about Biggie and claims that he slept with Faith. Now, she, of course, has fully denied this, and I get why she wouldn't want to admit it. But I also totally get why she would do it if she did do it. Well, here's the thing. We talked about this briefly in the Tupac episode that it was yeah. like he had had sex with with Biggie's wife. But we also didn't have the context that Biggie had been cheating on her repeatedly prior to that. We didn't have the context that she and Biggie got married after knowing each other only nine days. We didn't have any of, of that. So now that I'm hearing all of that context, I'm like, oh, yeah, it makes complete sense that she would be like. I'm going to go and and do this thing. I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying, hey, this is good behavior, positive behavior, healthy behavior. I'm not saying that at all. But hearing this now and getting this kind of backstory, I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I can see that she would be like, and and maybe she didn't realize there was uh, as much of a rift as she thought they were friends and she wanted them to be friends because she was really trying to, you know, stick the knife in. True. Um, But also like, just have you seen those eyelashes and how full they are i don't have time to go into can't get into eyelashes eyelashes. i wish we did look i wish we had time if you're interested in hearing my thoughts about (laughs) tupac's eyelashes uh check out uh check out the episode we did about tupac which was like episode 21 it could have been four days ago, four months ago, or four years ago. I have no idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, twenty or twenty-one. That's my, that's my guess. Yeah, it we'll feels see. like it was so much longer ago. But yes, it feels like it was sometime in 2020. It was not, but it that's just where we're at. Mm-hmm. So months later, Faith would meet up with Biggie on a trip to New Orleans. Uh, where Biggie had clearly moved on from the Tupac rumors and Biggie and, Biggie and Faith's romance rekindles once again. Later in 96, Biggie and Lil Cease get arrested for smoking pot in public and had their car impounded. Biggie chose a Chevy Lumina rental car despite Cease's objections. The car apparently had brake problems, which is insane to me that they were able to rent it out anyway. Uh, Biggie ignored the brake issues. The car collided with a rail, shattering Biggie's left leg and Lil Cease's jaw. Biggie spent months in a hospital, confined to a wheelchair, and then forced to use a cane for the rest of his life. Which is funny because I remember seeing photos of him like with a cane, but I just assumed that was like his big papa pimp. You thought it was like a prop. I thought it was like a persona thing. I didn't realize it was like an, oh no, he was like so badly, badly injured. Wow. Uh, September 96, Biggie receives devastating news that Tupac, a man Biggie still considered to be his friend, was killed in a drive-by shooting in Vegas. Again, we did cover the Biggie thing if you want, or the Tupac thing. If you want to look into the Tupac thing a little more. Episode 20, I just looked it up. Nice. I was only one off. You're very close. Yeah. Unless my counting was wrong because in margarita time. <laughs> I, I trust it. I trust it. Uh, who knows? Someday we're going to play a game like we did uh, once before where we just sit and see how far we can list our episodes in proper order and see which one of us gets the most right. Because at yes. some point, I don't know. Like, I, I know, know, I, I remember, know. I remember yeah. the case and then we don't do the case anymore and whoop, it has to leave to make room <laughs> for the next, for the next file. Yep. 
I only have a file folder worth of information stored in my head at all times. Uh, so October 29th, 1996, Faith gives birth to Biggie's son. Faith. Christ- I know. Christopher Jordan Wallace, a.k.a. CJ. She uh, got pregnant with the baby when she did that little trip to New Orleans. Oh. When they rekindled. Ah, so, uh, got it, got it, got yeah. it. We're sure? Because, well, yeah, I've done the math. So she was recording with Tupac in like October of 95. Mm -hmm. That math works out. Yes. And she wouldn't have been, uh, she wouldn't have conceived until like February, Mm -hmm. which is when she saw Biggie. So I know. Well, trust me, I've already been like, should I look at his eyelashes? (laughs) No, it's fine. It's fine. So uh, CJ is born, uh, despite the fact that they now have a child, Biggie and, Biggie and Faith's relationship is now just officially over. January 97, Biggie faces criminal assault charges and is ordered to pay $41,000 in damages from a dispute from two years before. So right now, Biggie's feeling the pressure, needs to take a breather, decides he's going to head out to California He wants to promote his new album and possibly help squash any East Coast, West Coast issues. At this point in time, the East Coast, West Coast feud was incredibly violent. Rappers from both sides uh, were accused of pulling weapons on each other backstage at the Source Awards the year before. There were rumors floating around that Puffy may have ordered the hit on Tupac. I may have been one of those people who spread those rumors. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but seriously oh. um you never know uh so puffy also didn't seem to realize that in compton gang loyalty was number one and since puffy was using crips uh gang members as part of his security which of course he denies but every other person in his life admits to um Without realizing it, Bad Boy Records had chosen their side in the gang war. Their rival Death Row Records had a long association with the blood subset mob Pyru, who were fiercely loyal to Suge and Death Row. So Suge Knight, it should be noted, one week before had been sentenced to nine years in prison for a parole violation that occurred the night of Tupac's death back in September. Now, here is where I wrote in my notes, but I've already said it, but I'm going to say it again because I put it in my notes. If you're looking for more info on that, check out our Tupac episode. You can find the video and a link to the audio on our website at truecrimeandcocktails.com. Really well done. (laughs) Thank you. I was nervous. (laughs) You shouldn't have been because you nailed it. And you know the material. You know what I mean? I do. But I'm also still thinking about his eyelashes and I think I put a little too much rum in that so my tongue feels a little extra big so I don't know what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I get that. I get that. So, so gang tensions are really high. Puffy thinks that Tupac is since Tupac is dead things have to have calmed down. Uh which is like the opposite of how most people would react in a situation like that. Uh, So Biggie, Puffy, and the usual entourage of junior mafia members, friends, and all of that head to California. While they're there, they shoot the video for Biggie's new single, Hypnotized, which we will get into later. I think I accidentally said hypnotized. I meant just hypnotized. I know what it's called. I know that jam. Trust me. I'm a white girl from the 90s. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one that I was referencing. It is, 100%. Uh, We'll get into that one in a bit because... Oh, that is a whole vibe. So uh, the bad boy crew is feeling pretty good about themselves. They go to the 11th annual Soul Train Music Awards, where Biggie presents Tony Braxton with the R&B Soul Single Award for You're Making Me High. Mm. While on stage. I just can't get by when I'm around. Isn't that that song? We can't sing. <sighs> the words 100%. because we'll get sued and we have 100%. to pay money. But I make me high. I can do that. Can't 100%. I? 100%. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I'm just going to say before I get back on that, uh, when Biggie got on stage, he got booed. Not by everyone, 
but there were people in the audience because a lot of the audience is <laughs> would have West Coast rappers in it. They they boot them. So there's a thing. Interesting. Now, this is also in my notes. Um, we know that they weren't booing Tony Braxton because she earned that fucking award. She is a treasure. You're okay. Me high is on point. She is so good. Like anytime I hear a Tony Braxton song, I I am like, ah, this woman, her voice, I think it's because also she's in more of like an alto range, which is like where my singing voice is. And I feel like yeah. it's rare that you hear someone who's just like a real kind of like in that era of time anyway. I just feel like, oh, she, no one brought it more. I love Tony Braxton. Agreed. I like that we're finding this out. I rewatched the video for You're Making Me High. I highly recommend it. Mm. So it is Tony sitting around with three women, like her girlfriends, in front of an elevator. Every few seconds, the elevator doors open and it's a different man. And they each hold up comically large, like foot tall playing cards where they're grading the men on how they're how they look. Um, so the video features Erica Alexander, Tisha Campbell, and Vivica A. Fox. That night, uh, Tony also won Best Female R&B Soul Album for Secrets, which what teenage girl didn't sing Unbreak My Heart so <gasps> passionately as though she had any fucking clue what heartbreak was about? You we know? didn't know, but you know how we knew? Because Tony, Tony knew. <laughs> I think, and I could be wrong, I think in that video for Unbreak My Heart is Tyson Beckford. I think you're right. Is one of Blanche's dreams because have you seen him? <laughs> I, yes. You're also going to love this. I have full goosebumps right now because I was just playing Unbreak My Heart in my head. That's how much that song it affects me. And for anyone who is a younger listener who isn't familiar with this, or if you're just not familiar with this song, Tony Braxton, T-O-N-I, Tony Braxton, B-R-A-X-T-O-N, Unbreak My Heart, it is going to become your breakup jam, your empowerment jam, all of the above. Yeah. I love that song. Yeah. I I haven't listened to the lyrics, so if there's anything problematic, don't, don't oh. come for us, okay? We're Look. so drunk. <laughs> It's Tony. It's not going to be problematic. Right? Um, the, the joke is what the one of the main things. First of all, I had that CD and mm. I loved it. Um, and You're Making Me High is just. God, you know what I else? Love you know what other one I liked? Yeah. Um, oh. Oh. Oh, my God. <laughs> Maybe it was You're Making Me High. Damn it. What was the first one we were talking about? You're making me high. Okay, yeah. no, then there's a third one. Hold on. So there was Unbreak My Heart, You're Making Me yeah. High, and then, um, oh, no, I think I'm singing. I'm trying to think of them in my head again. There's a third one, though, that I'm thinking of. It'll come back to me. It'll, we'll get there. We'll circle yeah. back. Yeah. Um, my point about her, main thing I remember besides, obviously, um, that voice of hers, and fuck, could not be more stunning. Gorgeous. Um, I remember she was on an episode of Oprah because I don't recall what happened because I didn't research this part because it wasn't part of what I was doing. Yeah. Um, her like business manager or something took advantage of her and wrote checks out of her account and like took her money. And all I remember from the Oprah interview is Oprah like taking her hands and being like, Tony, you just need to write your own checks. And Tony was like, yes, yes, I will. In like a, okay, I get it. Oprah's telling me, I understand I'm hearing it. But it was like this huge deal that she was willing to give this interview. And But also Oprah, like sometimes people get taken advantage of. And like you have to have someone manage your money for you. Like you can't be expected to know how to manage your money. That sounds stupid, but it's really true. Especially for someone like her who is bringing in so much money at that point. Like I think that that's also like, let's give Tony a break. Oh, I know. But if our Oprah doesn't drop being a hard ass sometimes, then she's not right. Oprah. You know? If you don't love me, if you don't need, if you don't need me, tell me who do you love? Remember that one? Who do you love? Who do you? I remember the song "Who Do You Love" by Deborah Cox. Have I? I've conflated. 
Fuck her. You know who else I love? Deborah Cox. <laughs> they had a very similar tone. Similar tone. Similar tone. Exact same time. Isn't Deborah Cox also Canadian? I do believe so. I think she was like the Canadian Tony Braxton. I like that a lot. Um, I would also, if we're since we're in it now, I want to bring up Desiree. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I feel like I'm gonna be listening to some '90s lady jams after this because yeah. Desiree was "You Gotta Be." You gotta oh. be bad. You gotta, you gotta be, be bold. You, gotta you can't be, be singing these songs. We're this episode's gonna get pulled. Just, like it just goes through an algorithm, and it, if it hears if the computer hears too much of a song, it just pulls it down. Well, now that I know that, I'm like, oh, I should purposely sing it wrong. The yeah. joke is. If I sing it wrong, it's not on purpose. I just never learned the proper words. I'm going to say something that I can't believe I'm saying because we already do so much work on this podcast and it's it's so overwhelming and I can't put anything else on my own plate because uh -huh. I also have so much so many other things going on. But I think I need to make a playlist. <laughs> like a like a podcast playlist? Like for this episode, like we're like a lady, like a 90s lady jams playlist. <laughs> Oh, that sounds like the, <laughs> that don't you think? Sounds like the homework that I want. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and then we're but see and see. This is how it starts. We do one. It's gonna be a hit because we know, <laughs> like we know what to listen to, and then it's gonna be like every episode. Then we're all of a sudden it's coming up with Spotify playlists for every single episode of the podcast, and I'm not mad at it. It's just that you're already not sleeping and I'm already pretty close okay. to not sleeping, you know? How about we yeah. only consider doing a playlist like that when it when someone in the case is a singer or if we bring up a singer? I like it. Whereas if and what it's not I like, a singer, we don't have that pressure. Yes. And what I like about this is that it's not at all notorious <laughs> PIG related. It is the women, yeah. it is the women that we want to celebrate that were inspired by this episode. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. Hypnotize? Come on. Are we doing multiple playlists? Well. <laughs> I mean, look, if we're doing, <laughs> if there's any male playlists involved, we have to put in NWA because I've been on a real kick lately and I'll be really no, upset if you we love don't. it. I know. I do. Uh, and uh, I shout out to that listener. I so sorry in this moment. I can't remember. Um, but after shortly after we did the Tupac episode, someone reached out and was like, Christy, have you seen straight out of Compton? And I was like, I had not. And then I watched it and I wept and I, <laughs> I had, I had a real, real moment. Um, and then that turned into like, well, now I need to hear the soundtrack. And then, oh, now I need to hear the legit like NWA Straight Outta Compton album. And then I need to hear more NWA albums. And then, well, while I'm at it, I better get some old Ice Cube and some old Easy E and some. And before you know it, this bitch is stuck in the '90s and she can't get out and doesn't want to leave. <laughs> and before you know it, I think you already have the playlist made. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I don't. I have. I. I do have a playlist in my uh, iTunes called Bad Bitches, which is what just it, like every female that I love. What really. if it's Christie's 90s jams and Lauren's 90s jellies? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Right? I, I would like us both to come up with like a, I don't know, we'll set a limit on it because if we yeah. don't. It'll be unstoppable. It'll be too much. So we're just It'll be going too much. like 90s. I think it's 90s. And I think that we have to set a song limit as though we were burning a CD. Because for those who don't know, we come from a time. Well, we come from a time where you could make a mixtape on a cassette tape. But, um, you know, you, could, you have to choose your songs wisely because you had to fill either a cassette tape or a CD. There was a maximum amount of time. Yeah. So, you know, not like now where I'm assuming playlists can just go on forever. Look, there's rules. We're going to come up with them. The point is, is that I think I've talked us into this now, and I'm sorry. Um, yes. I mean, 
you, the playlists now can be insane. I will give a shout out. He's never going to hear this. I do have a, like a 14 and a half hour playlist on Spotify. That is just nothing but songs by octopus caveman. <laughs> hey, and, uh, when I do go to bed, I let it play overnight in the hopes of just giving him a little bit of extra listens while I'm sleeping. So that's nice. I think we yeah. follow each other on Twitter. I I think he's lovely. He's very funny, very talented. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's a song he ha- there's multiple songs. Obviously, he has 14 and a half hours worth. Uh, there's a song he has uh, called Devils in the Details, which is one that I love a lot. And there's one I can't remember the name of it, but I'll look into it. Um, that just just destroys your heart. <laughs> just destroys your heart and makes you stop and go oh well I hate the world (laughs) yeah kudos to him for making me feel things was my point he makes me laugh a lot and then I found out he makes art and that kind of thing um I also emailed him or I I snuck into those dms once just to be like hey love what you're doing whatever and he responded and was really lovely and uh I'm not saying acknowledge me but I'm I'm just saying I I think you're great that's what I'm saying. So <laughs> I, uh, well, I love where this is gone. Um, you, you feel things. What I'm feeling is yeah. we need to take a quick break. Yeah. Refresh your drink, hit the toilet. We're going to be back very shortly. And then we're going to get into, of course, the unfortunate murder, the death and the fallout of the notorious B.I.G. That's right. Biggie on this episode of true crime and cocktails, famous fatalities edition here. Welcome back, everybody, to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails, Famous Fatalities Edition. Of course, we are talking about Notorious B.I.G. Before the break, we went on completely off-the-rails tangent about female songstresses from the 90s that we loved. I'm cracking another um, can of of these cut water margaritas. Again, I want to remind you, each can is two margaritas, so by the time I'm done this... And good night, nurse. Um, but let's get back into it because the the point that we left off at, unfortunately, and listen, it's because we get sad. We always go off the rails when it's around the time of the death because we we get sad when we have to talk about the actual um, details uh, sometimes of of the deaths. So we were talking about the Soul Train Music Awards. Now we're talking about, of course, March 9th, nineteen ninety seven. Correct. Uh, well, we're gonna scoot just like a little back, but right. we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Biggie and his entourage were meant to go to London around this time, but Biggie canceled the trip as he had concerns that the security arrangements were inadequate. He told his mother not to worry about LA as they had off duty cops guarding them. Biggie then did a radio interview in San Francisco where he mentioned hiring a security detail as he feared for his safety. Yet, for some reason, they still went to California. So March 8th, the night after the awards, uh, Soul Train had their after party and Biggie didn't want to go. He was tired from his hectic schedule. He just wanted to relax. But Puffy insisted that they both make an appearance at the party to show that the booze at the award uh, hadn't rattled them in any way. So the after party was being hosted by Vibe Magazine and held at the Peterson Automotive Museum, which opened in 1994. Thank you. Uh, The party was apparently an amazing time, full of love and alcohol, and it also seemed to bring East and West Coasts together. A small peak of the guests in attendance. Some of these are very like, oh, that takes me back. Aaliyah. Missy Elliott. Wesley Snipes, hello, Mary J. Blige, Whitney Houston, Chris Tucker, Keenan and Marlon Wayans. There were NBA stars. There were NFL stars. Seal. Oh, I love Seal. Uh, And and, and, and. (laughs) And the, the joke is, I'm not even doing a bit. I legit don't know the words to that song. I don't know that anybody really does. And that's part of what's so beautiful yeah. about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love him. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yes. Wow. That's a star studded um, event. A hundred percent. Another person 
who was at the event, Faith Evans, who had just given birth to Biggie's son less than five months before. Uh, that part is fine with me because my God, you just gave birth. You go have a party if you want. The part that is weird to me is that while they were there, they never spoke. They saw each other, but never interacted in any way. So I find that really weird. Yeah. So less familiar faces um, in the crowd include Crip gang members, Keefe D and his nephew, Orlando Anderson who mm-hmm. you may recall from our Tupac episode where I basically said that Orlando was probably the trigger man behind Tupac's <laughs> death. Yes. Uh, Keefe D uh, said that he brought, quote, a dozen gangbangers with them, all there by invitation of Puffy, who once again is like, I don't know what they're talking about, man. Which, that just seems like Puffy in a nutshell. Yeah. Um. Again, I'm allowed to like what's on the outside, but not what's the on the inside. Of course. (laughs) I'm a weirdo. So uh, Biggie is tired, doesn't want to go. Puffy insists that he represent. Biggie decides that he'll go, hopefully to talk to someone about his new dream of getting into acting. He did play himself on an episode of Martin in 1995 and got a taste for it and really wanted to branch out. So the, the party event coordinator, Carla Radford, uh, said that she retained the services of a private protection firm that was meant to add to the museum's own security. They also borrowed a guard from the National Natural History Museum, bringing the security total to a whopping 10. <laughs> wow. In a space that it could accommodate 1200 people so you know that feels like maybe not enough uh oh so that's not just for biggie that's for the whole event that is for the entire event excuse me i said wow because i thought that that was just for him that's for the whole event got it i mean to be fair biggie and uh puffy had their own bodyguards with them but that is also another issue i will get into shortly um so There was a fire marshal from Station 52 uh, who was on scene to monitor for any safety violations. He called LAPD to help with crowd control around 11 p.m. LAPD arrives about 20 minutes later and just goes, you know what? There's like a thousand or so people here. There's not very many of us. We don't want to anger them and have this big mob at us. Let's just let this party fizzle out on its own. Right. So at this point, party poppin'. Do the kids say poppin'? I don't know. Okay. Uh, There was a lot of love and mutual respect amongst the artists. Drinks were flowing. And Biggie's new single, Hypnotize, was on repeat every 10 minutes, which I'm not even kidding. Sounds like a fucking dream. Uh, (laughs) Because Hypnotize... You're going to love this. This is when professional, 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 I'm not well. Well, This is when professional business Christy comes out. Hypnotize has a hook based on a sample from the song Rise by Herb Alpert and has been described as the perfect showcase for Biggie's trademark loose and easy flow. Some may recall Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass for their smash hit Spanish fleet. According to Blanche, Herb Alpert is like a young James Garner, which (laughs) news alert, Blanche likes a young James Garner. I never doubted that she would. I never doubted it. Blanche is all over the place. Um, uh, Also, uh, Hypnotize, once again, that song is just a full vibe. As soon as you hear it, you're just like, yeah, like you can't be mad that I'm just, that song is just amazing to me. Uh, So around midnight, so an hour later, the fire marshal is like, you know what? Fuck this. We're over capacity. I'm shutting this shit down. So 12.05 AM, there were reports of a shot being fired from a black Ford Bronco outside the museum. Multiple witnesses got a license plate and they matched or they watched the vehicle head south on Orange Grove Avenue. 
Without knowledge of that happening, Biggie and his entire entourage leave the museum and join a three-car convo, which consists of two uh, green Chevy Suburbans and a black Chevy Blazer, all 1997 models. Now, vehicle number one, driver was Ken Story. It had Puffy and bodyguards Eugene Deal, which was like Puffy's main bodyguard, Steve Jordan, and Anthony Jacobs. Then you got vehicle two, driven by Gregory G. Money Young. It had Biggie, Lil Cease, D-Rock, and Groovy Lou Jones. Third vehicle was a Blazer, driven by Reggie Blaylock, and it also had Paul Offord, who was Bad Boy's chief of security. Now, the one thing I really want to point out, which isn't in my notes yet, so I'm already ahead of myself, um, vehicle number one was Puffy and three fucking bodyguards. Vehicle two was Biggie and zero fucking bodyguards. So how does that work out? Um, also, some of the men were planning to head to a after-after party, but Biggie and Puffy were like, you know what? We're going to go to the hotel, get some sleep so we can get up early and get into the um, studio early in the morning before their flight back home. So my question then is, if Biggie and Puffy were both going to the hotel and the other guys were going to a party, why weren't Biggie and Puffy in the same vehicle? And again, why did Biggie not have any security with it? Can I say something already that I know is probably getting ahead of myself? I like him on the outside, but not on the inside. So please. Do we think Puffy had something to do with this? Um, I think, I know we're a little early for this, but I think that Puffy, I mean, Biggie, not only like cash aside and how much money that Biggie was making for Puffy and the fact that he was putting Puffy's label on the map, all of that aside, I don't think Puffy would want him dead. Has he made crazy money off of him since then? Of course he has. Um, but I don't think he'd want him dead. My thought is more, he realizes it's his fault that he did mm. other things that led to this is what I got think. it because spoiler alert, I think, this was like a retaliation for Tupac. And I think, I think Puffy had something to do with that. I think he was like, I don't oh. like the competition. Take him out. And I think he realized this, this is my own fault. And he's carrying the guilt with him since then. But I don't know, maybe we'll touch on that in a bit. Yeah. 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 Um, so the first SUV that has Puffy in it turns through a yellow light and prece proceeds down Wilshire. Boulevard. The second SUV with Biggie stops at a red light about 50 yards from the museum. While waiting for the light to change, a white Toyota Land Cruiser makes a U-turn and tries to cut in between Biggie and the security detail behind him. Um, at the time, at that like at the same time that this car is doing that, a dark Chevy Impala SS pulls up alongside Biggie's SUV. The Impala driver, who is later described as an unidentified African-American male dressed in a blue suit and bow tie with a fade haircut, rolled down his window, used a nine millimeter handgun and fired six shots at Biggie's SUV. The Impala then speeds off onto Wilshire Boulevard, accelerating east. So security sees this happen. They're in the vehicle behind, uh, behind Biggie. Uh, they chase the Blazer, or they chase the uh, Land Cruiser, but the Blazer that they're in has a built-in gas governor, which decreases fuel supply if the car exceeds 90 miles per hour, so security loses sight of the Impala and just circles back to the crime scene. At the sound of the shots, Puffy's SUV does a U-turn, pulls directly in front of Biggie's SUV, Puffy gets out, goes right to Biggie, but Biggie at this point is unconscious. All three vehicles head straight to Cedar Sinai, where it is found that Biggie has been hit by four of the six shots. Doctors performed an emergency thoracotomy. However, Biggie was pronounced dead at 1.15 a.m. Doctors later, later determined that Biggie probably died at the scene. In 2011, 
the FBI released the original case file to the public, which included the autopsy report. Copies of both you will find in our virtual case file on truecrimeandcocktails.com. Thank you very much. Uh, The autopsy showed that while Biggie was shot four times, only one of the bullets had actually been fatal. Biggie was shot in the left forearm, the back, the left thigh, and the fatal shot entered his right hip, hit his colon, his liver, his heart, his left lung, and then stopped in his left shoulder, which is insane to me. Um, It's also said that at the party, Biggie was drinking Dom Perignon, uh, but the autopsy showed that he had no alcohol in his system whatsoever. So if he was drinking, it must have been very little. And like right when they got there early in the evening, because you would think even then there'd be like a slight hint of it by that point. Yeah. It just feels like alcohol stays in your system for several hours. So I'm surprised it, that yeah. there was not any. Um, at the hospital, Biggie's entourage had the tentative discussion as to who was going to inform Biggie's mom, Valletta. Oh. So D-Rock, who was probably one of the, cl- well, it's tough to say they were all very close with him, but D-Rock, I think, and Lil Cease were fair, were probably the closest at that point. Um, D-Rock was the one who called Valletta to break the news, and Valletta, Valletta later said, based on the sobbing, she knew in the moment that she answered the phone that her son was dead. Now, before we get too far off, I want to talk about these other two vehicles uh, from the incident. There was a black Bronco. And there was a white land cruiser. So there was just something so weird. And the cops are like, no, we explained it. It's fine. And I'm like, but did you? Uh, So the police report describes the hit as very professional. And it made the police wonder if the first gunshot that was heard at 1205 was a distraction to have everybody go that way while Biggie was being shot on the other side. So LAPD officers were en route to the location of the Bronco when the Impala pulled up next to Biggie. So to me, that's like, oh, they, it did its job. Police found the vehicle thanks to the witness accounts and found two men had arrived at the museum with the hopes of getting into the party. When that didn't work out, they were driving away. And for some reason, the driver opened his door which made his gun fall out from the pocket in the door. And when his gun hit the, hit the ground, he was like, oh my God, it might be damaged. I need to make sure it's not damaged. So he s- put his arm straight in the air and fired a shot to make sure it was okay. People around him freaked out, obviously. Um, and so he got scared and left the scene. Detectives interrogated him after uh, he was arrested for negligent discharge of a firearm, they decided that he was simply an idiot who was showing off. To which I say, how sure are you? That's all. I'm always suspicious anytime Mm -hmm. anyone is written off as being like a dummy or they didn't know or whatever. I'm like, are you sure though? Like, is that like, that's that to me is, is like, that's not a quote, official diagnosis to me do you know what i mean like yeah yeah it just just because you can't find a link anywhere doesn't mean that there's not one hundred percent have you let me try yet give her 20 minutes just tell me the name computers tell me his name give her a name come on i know i know (laughs) i know the joke is at some point we're gonna have a cop who's like you know what fine you get 20 minutes and I'm going to just be like, ah. I know. And, and then I'll be like, what case, what case, pick a case. I know. And we're going to waste the time or I'm going to be like, okay, great. And I'm just going to go. And it's going to be a series of like file cards, like taped together. That's got all the information I'm going to quickly look up. Start making them now. I know. God, I've got to be ready. I've got to be ready at all times. That's got to be what's in my go bag. Yeah, I have a go bag now. I guess I have to make a go bag now. You do. Uh, so that vehicle, obviously, the Bronco, sketchy. The fact, what are the odds at that time a shot goes off? It just feels yeah. very much uh, suspect. So 
There was also the white land cruiser that tried to get between the security and Biggie's vehicle that also distracted security to the point they didn't even notice the Impala up beside Biggie until it was too late. Not that I think they could have really done anything, but still, this vehicle was a distraction. So turns out the vehicle was driven by a man named Scott Shepard and his screenwriter friend, Ernest Anderson, who hoped to write a biopic on Biggie's life. They learned of the party and tried to tag along behind the entourage in the hopes of getting into the party. They were not successful. Uh, They followed Biggie's SUV, hoping that they could get they could approach him at the next destination, but when shots rang out, they freaked out and took off. Years later, the screenwriter's phone number would show up frequently on Suge Knight's phone records, which police assumed meant he was trying to make a movie about Suge. But then I'm like, devil's advocate, please. What if he was contacting Suge trying to get paid for being the distraction he was paid for? Great point. You know? Um, So there have been a lot of questions about how did the shooter know which vehicle Biggie would be in and which seat. The vehicles all had tinted windows. Um, Some theorized that the hit was meant for Puffy, uh, which would also explain why he had three freaking bodyguards in his vehicle. Uh, There were numerous witnesses to the murder, but many were just too scared to come forward. Even D-Rock, who was in the vehicle with Biggie at the time, said that Puffy told him if any of their names show up on the witness list, they're fired. Which is interesting. interesting. You'd think you'd want anything to help get justice for your friend. But it just feels like he's just not interested. We'll get into also more about, or just another thing of why I'm not 100% sure about Puffy in a bit. Uh, so some of the fans uh, were in town from Houston. They got a grainy cell phone video of the shooting. However, the video just shows Puffy's vehicle turning the corner and then the phone is like looking at something else and you hear the shot. So you don't see the Impala at all, which is too much. It's kind of disappointing because you can't at least get a feel for it and who might've been in the car. But also at the same time, it was very like, it, I didn't, I didn't like seeing the video where you could hear the actual shot. And then it was terrifying. Uh, So March 18th, 1997, a funeral was held for Biggie. 350 guests sat through a ceremony that was called, quote, the final tour. Puffy delivered the eulogy. Faith Evans, who was still legally Biggie's wife, sang the hymn, Walk With Me, Lord. The recessional was an instrumental version of Biggie's song, Miss You, which he had written after the death of Tupac. Some of the famous mourners include, because I like to give the people a list, Queen Latifah, Run DMC, Salton Peppa, Mary J. Blige, Tommy Hilfiger, Lauren Hill, Maxine Waters, Naomi Campbell, and Lil Kim. Now I'm going to say this about Lil Kim. There, I did, I did post in the uh, case file I put on Instagram and on Facebook. I did post some pictures from the funeral of just like casket and flower arrangement stuff um, that I felt were interesting. But there is a photo that I saw of Lil Kim at the funeral and I'm not going to post it. Um, I didn't want it saved in any way because it just based on the photo, it's just pure grief. And I feel whether she admitted to herself or not, she was completely in love with him and you can mm. see it, you see it in the photo. So, I mean, if you want to look, Google it. Right. Um, but I, I just can't bring myself to post it because it just feels, I don't want to bring attention to someone's grief. Because um, I know if I was in that situation, I wouldn't want photos of me uh, of passed course. around either. Of course. So uh, the funeral motorcade drove over the Brooklyn Bridge and into the heart of Biggie's old neighborhood in downtown Brooklyn. The event was described as a love riot where thousands of fans lined the street to pay their respects 
local schools even let the kids out early so that they could stand in the crowd to be there when Biggie passed through. Really? Uh, Adding further insult to injury, though, riot-equipped SWAT teams used nightsticks and pepper spray to disperse the crowd that they felt were unruly onlookers. (laughs) Police aren't going to get the best uh, painted portrait in this coming forward, so brace yourself, folks. I have no idea the words that I've just said. Um, (laughs) So just 16 days after Biggie's death, his new album, Life After Death, was released, despite the unfortunate title, uh, which was chosen before uh, he died. Uh, It hit number one on Billboard 200 charts and would later be certified Diamond, which is the highest IRAA certification awarded to a solo hip hop album. Oh, the b- biggest success on that album was the single Mo Money Mo Problems, which reached number one on the Hot 100 and made Biggie the first artist to have a top spot posthumously. So now we're going to get into the police investigation. Um, but first, we have to take a little journey that seems unrelated. Uh, But in true Christy fashion, I'm going to bring it all back around. There's always a method to her madness, folks. A hundred percent. So get comfy. Um, So first, we need to talk about the highly respected and decorated LAPD detective Russell Poole. Poole joined the LAPD in 1981. He joined robbery homicide in 1996 and served as the primary investigator on at least 135 homicide cases and assisted on over 500 more. Poole and his partner, Fred Miller, were assigned to investigate the shooting death of LAPD officer Kevin Gaines that occurred March 18th, 1997, which was just nine days after Biggie. So Gaines was a 31-year-old officer who was off duty at the time when he was shot and killed by an undercover LAPD detective named Frank Liga. According to Liga and other witness accounts, Gaines pulled his SUV up to the car at a red light. Gaines flashed what Liga believed were gang signs. And during a heated exchange, Gaines said he would put a cap in his ass. Both vehicles drove forward when the light turned green, but Gaines followed Liga at high speed, swerving into oncoming traffic to keep up with him. At the next red light, Liga pulled his weapon out, called for backup. Gaines pulled out a weapon of his own. Liga fired, killing Gaines. This caused a full media shitstorm because Gaines was black and Liga was white. Oh. After three separate internal investigations, Liga was exonerated of any wrongdoing, concluding that his actions were not racially or improperly motivated. Keeping in mind, Gaines was an officer, but at no point ever said, I'm a police officer. He never identified himself. Then again, neither did the other guy. The other guy was undercover, but still. So I was going to leave it at that, but in my last ditch Hail Mary research, uh, I found a quick side note. This happened in 97. Well, in 2013, Detective Liga was recorded during a training session at the LAP, Los Angeles, fuck, at the Los Angeles Police Academy where he told the class that not only did he not have any regrets about shooting Gaines, but he also, quote, wished there were more of them in the car at the time. He then went further to say that he could have, quote, killed a truckload of them and not felt anything and would be happy to do it. Oh, my God. So it turns out that Liga's a piece of shit. Uh, He retired before he was fired, but then two years later, somehow was awarded $50,000 for a wrongful termination suit, 
which makes me want to scream into the void, but I don't have time. Yeah. So. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, so while looking into the life of Kevin Gaines after his death, Detective Poole starts to feel that things are a little bit off. Uh, Poole found that Gaines had been involved in multiple road rage incidents. And then shortly after Gaines was shot, his personnel file just went missing. Oh. Mm -hmm. So the shooting with uh, the undercover officer, uh, to me, it sounds like Kevin Gaines was playing gangsta. You know, like he was throwing yes. gang signs, all of this. It said that he liked to frequent a death row records um, hangout called Monty's Steakhouse. He was an admitted member of the Bloods. At the time, he was dating Sharitha Knight, who just happens to be Suge's ex-wife. Whoa! We all remember Suge Knight, uh, the death, the head of death row records, right? Uh, so Gain, speaking of Gain's relationship with Suge's ex-wife, while they were dating, Sharitha was the manager for Snoop Dogg. In 1993, Snoop Dogg and two members of Death Row were charged in the murder of a gang member. And wouldn't you know, forensic and ballistic evidence that were crucial to the case went missing while in possession of the LAPD from a location that Gaines had access to. Just like the Tupac gun went missing? Mm-hmm. I don't know if you could hear Whoa! that sound, but that was, that was me being very excited. Um, That's wild. Mm -hmm. So another incident that came up in the investigation was the time that Gaines went to a gas station near his home called 911 to say an assault with a deadly weapon had occurred at his address. The victim was down. He gave a description of the victim, which was just basically a description of himself. He wouldn't give his name or say that he was an officer. Two officers happened to be in the area, so they met him at his home as he was pulling up to the house. They asked they told him about the 911 call, asked if they could get inside his house. He refused. Uh, it wasn't until after they handcuffed him that he finally identified himself as a police officer and then afterwards filed a lawsuit against the LAPD. Uh, but then it was proven that he made the 911 call himself and no charges were ever filed. So I'm wildly curious about what he was planning there <laughs> was he going to shoot himself and be like i was attacked but what would you get from the, unless he was going to blame somebody else i don't know what he was doing but what a weird that's situation. interesting yeah wow yeah it's like what what was your end game what did you know like there's a lot of questions there for sure yeah the connection but to suge knight you can't look away from no, you can't. I because I'm sorry, but also very quickly, he's dating. I'm sorry, I don't know that you said he was dating or married to. I, I'm just so blown away by this connection to, yeah. to Shug's ex-wife. He was dating Shug's ex-wife. Dating her. Well, you I don't need to tell anybody, I don't need to explain to anybody, like, you know, if you're coming off of the tales of a of a marriage that's maybe not the best, your next boyfriend or you know, the next couple of relationships, you're probably going to be pretty open about how bad that marriage was. Right. It doesn't see, like, again, like what did, what did Kevin Gaines know? I have a lot of questions. Yeah, um, I do too. I do does. too. Uh, another time with Kevin Gaines, he was found to be in possession of another cop's personally designed handcuffs that had been what? reported missing. Now, I have more questions about what they mean by personally designed, like they had their name on it or they personally designed them themselves because I I want to know more, but if they personally designed them and the police allowed it, I'm upset by it. So I just didn't look into that further. Um, when hearing about the that it was being called a theft, 
Gaines file was lost at internal affairs and magically reappeared one week after the one year statute of limitations had passed. Stop. So the investigation into Gaines started providing clues for something called the Rampart scandal. In the early 90s, the LAPD started a special anti-gang unit in the Rampart Division of the LAPD called CRASH, stands for Community Resources Against Street Hoodlums. It is said that they used, quote, questionable methods to get the job done, and their motto was, we intimidate those who intimidate others. CRASH officers would get together to celebrate shootings. The supervisors would hand out plaques to the shooters containing red or black playing cards. You'd get a red card that indicated you wounded someone or a red card, which was considered more prestigious for killing someone. These officers also wore tattoos with the crash logo, which is a skull with a cowboy hat surrounded by playing cards. And I'm sorry, but in my head, there is nothing less menacing than any skull in a cowboy hat. Yeah. I'm also thinking probably the comically large cowboy hats. So I'm sure your, your skull tattoos are super mean. Now, I'm so sorry, but I think you said you get a red card for wound uh, shooting and then a red card for killing. Sorry, you get a black card for death. Thank you very if much. If you kill someone. So sorry. Great. Again. No, no. I just want to make sure before nope. we get the letters, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, well, they're coming. <laughs> we know they're coming. So, no, this is this is fascinating to me. I am so in this. I cannot wait. Well, okay, get ready. It gets worse. I can't wait. Uh, so by the late 1990s, uh, more than 70 police officers either assigned to or associated with the Rampart crash unit were implicated in some sort of misconduct, making it one of the most widespread cases of do- documented police corruption in U.S. history. Wow. We don't have time to get into all of it. We're going to touch on a few uh, just because there are a couple characters I would like us to uh, focus on. So Gaines was part of the crash unit, as was Officer David Mack. Now, David Mack was sketchy to Detective Poole right away. When they got a search warrant, police found a full shrine to Tupac in Mack's house. Shut up! as well as numerous nine millimeter guns, a nine millimeter shot biggie, Uh, LAPD radios and scanners. Also, police did not run ballistics to compare the bullets from biggie to any of the guns or ammo found at Mac's house. At one point, Mac was awarded the LAPD Medal of Heroism for shooting a drug dealer who reportedly threatened his partner, Rafael Perez. Later, it turned out they actually planted a gun on the suspect. (laughs) Oh, my God. So eight months after Biggie's murder, Officer Mac and two accomplices robbed a Bank of America branch of $722,000. Shut the fuck up. A bank employee, Errol Lynn Romero, confessed to her role in the robbery and implicated her boyfriend, David Mack. When they met, she was only 19 and he was 29. Uh, Uh, Mack was then sentenced to 14 years in federal prison. He never revealed the identities of his accomplices or the whereabouts of the money, but he bragged to fellow inmates that he will be a millionaire by the time of his release. He left prison in May of 2010 and currently works at a green energy company in South California. Uh, A jailhouse informant, who I do not trust, uh, claims that the money was meant to go to David Mack's friend, Harry Billups, for carrying out the hit on Biggie. The informant also said he was given the job by Shug's lawyer, David Kenner. Now, another jailhouse informant told the police that he heard Biggie's killer's name was something Middle Eastern sounding like Amir, Ashmir, or Abraham. So then police start looking through prison visitation logs and see that a man named Amir Muhammad visited David Mack 
at the prison and they were like, oh shit, here it is. This is a Middle Eastern sounding name. We've got this. Right. Well, Amir Mohammed is just like a mortgage broker whose name is really Harry Billups. And he changed it after he became like an avowed Muslim. He seems fairly like nothing is really sketchy about him. Billups and Mac were college roommates and both were members of the track and field team. Uh, So when Mac went to jail, his wife called Billups up and asked him to visit. The LA Times printed an article saying that Billups was the shooter, even printing a picture of his face. They later had to retract the article and apologize when it was found out that the police didn't consider him a suspect and had not even interviewed him. Wow. Yeah. Well, we're, we're getting to one of the worst ones. Another dirty cop uh, and the central figure in the Rampart scandal is Rafael Perez. He's a full piece of shit. Now, the main reason I say that, uh, Rafael Perez and his partner, Nino Durden, shot a 19-year-old man named Javier Avando after he fired on them. Avando was sentenced to 23 years in prison for the incident, but he ended up getting released about two and a half years later when Perez confessed that they shot him and then planted a gun at the scene. Oh my God. Oh, and I'm sorry. Did I not mention that when they shot him, they paralyzed him from the waist down? Oh my God. So Avando sued the city and was awarded $15 million, which is the largest police misconduct settlement in Los Angeles history. Oh, good. Jesus. A hundred percent. Perez, piece of shit. He gets accused of being a member of the Bloods and for being and for murdering Biggie on orders from Suge. But then Perez is arrested for stealing seven pounds of cocaine from the police evidence room. He later admits that he stole the drugs and replaced them with Bisquick. (laughs) Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, I'm sorry that this is what I have to dig into for a second. But okay, you st- seven pounds, great. Yeah. You can get a you know ten pound bag of flour, no problem. But bisquick, like that's a, it's gonna cost you more money, and b, it's not coming in like you're gonna have to buy so many boxes of bisquick. I feel like. Yeah, I, I'm guessing just like color and maybe consistency. It was closer to. Wow. Yeah. Okay. He, he potentially okay. made a lot of money off that Coke, especially if he sold it on the street versus just like wholesale, which apparently those prices are vastly different. Again, uh, we're not recommending you go into the business. We are not recommending drugs. I also just want to remind everyone that one of my biggest fears on the planet is yeah. Crooked cops, dirty cops freak me out more than anything. This is literally going to give me nightmares. Keep going. I cannot get enough. So Perez gets arrested for the, uh, for the, for the biscuit. Uh, And so his reaction was to flip on all of the dirty cops in the crash unit. He implicated the 70 officers in various wrongdoings Of those officers, there was enough evidence that 58 had internal administrative um, investigations. Jesus. 12 were given suspensions. Seven were forced to either retire or resign. And five were terminated. But before we get our hopes up, those five that were later reinstated with full back pay. Of course. Mm Mm-hmm. So after the whole drug stealing thing, Perez is sentenced to five years in prison, but was released after like a year uh, for a plea deal, a plea deal which gave him immunity from further prosecution of misconduct from the scandal investigations. Uh, 
he now works as a limo driver and at one point was driving Harvey Weinstein. So Oh no. <laughs> that feels right. It feels extremely right. People with the wow. same energy always find each other, don't they? Uh so a quick note on Officer Rafael Perez. The 2001 movie Training Day, Denzel Washington said he emulated the style of Perez to give authenticity to his portrayal of a corrupt cop. The license plate in the movie is ORP 967, which stands for Officer Rafael Perez, who was born in 1967. Shut up! The TV series The Shield is based on the Rampart scandal. Now, throughout this whole scandal investigation, as a result of the probe into falsified evidence and police perjury, 106 prior criminal convictions were overturned. The scandal resulted in more than 140 civil lawsuits against the city of Los Angeles and cost the city an estimated $125 million in settlements. Wow. As of 2020, the full extent of the Rampart corruption is not known, and several rape, homicide, and robbery investigations involving Rampart officers remain unsolved. So that was our fun. This is kind of like stuff that Detective Poole figured out while looking into Kevin Gaines. So we're going to go back to Detective Poole he starts looking through things, finds these corrupt officers. He starts to piece together that some of them maybe had something to do with Biggie's murder. He collects a 40-page report and takes it to the chief of the LAPD, who orders Poole to stop any and all investigations into Officer David Mack. Again, David Mack had the shrine to Tupac, he had nine millimeter weapon and ammo, and they never did any testing on it whatsoever. Chief of police, do not. He says, do not touch that man, leave him alone. Poole gets so upset about this, he resigns in protest and becomes a private investigator. So Poole believed that Shug, with the help of officer David Mack, was responsible for the death of Biggie as a retaliation for the murder of Tupac, which Poole believes was staged by death row to look like a gang hit. Right. So Poole's biggest source of info came from a former Compton police officer named Kevin Hackey, who claimed that Kevin Gaines, David Mack, and Rafael Perez were part of Suge's extended posse. Hackey himself worked closely with Death Row, claiming to witness multiple heated arguments about money between Suge and Tupac. Hackey also claimed he had numerous documents to back up everything he was saying, although he kept having an excuse as to why he couldn't actually produce them. And when he was needed to testify the night before the trial, he said, oh, by the way, uh, I suffer from severe memory lapses due to the medications I'm taking. Oh, and I may have also filed a false declaration during this. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. So much of Poole's investigation uh, was used for the basis of a book by Randall Sullivan. Now this book is the longest title of a book I've seen. <laughs> In my life. And I'm going to keep talking and you're going to be like, she cannot possibly still be saying the name of this book. Somehow I am. The book is called Labyrinth. A detective investigates the murders of Tupac Shakur and Notorious B.I.G., the implication of death row records, Shug Knight, and the origins of the Los Angeles police scandal. Now, that is a very fucking long book title. Too long. It's just not going to work. Too long. They wanted um, to have a lot of a lot of key words they in wanted, there. They did. Yeah, they did. They may as well have just called it Tupac Biggie Shug Knight. <laughs> yeah, that, exactly. It catches the attention short to the point. So this book got made into a movie with a much shorter title. It's called City of Lies. It 
was made in like 2018, uh, it only recently came out that they're like, we had shelved it, but no, we're going to release it. It's supposed to be coming out sometime soon. It may have by the time uh, this has actually dropped. But um, Detective Pool is played by Johnny Depp. No way. Yeah. Which was either very kind or not. I don't know. It depends how you feel about Johnny Depp. Well, yeah. I mean, there's very problems. kind or very problematic. A hundred percent. Now I'm so um, sorry. I, I I I have to pee again. I'm so sorry. No, that's fine. Two seconds. Two seconds. Okay. I'm just I'm I'm blown away by all of this information. I I just have to go on record as saying. Now, I do have to be the bearer of bad news. I'd like to hear it. Now, Detective Pool um, was just like a solid cop, which is nice, especially when we are surrounded by so many in this case. That we're it's not. nice. It's, it's nice. nice. Uh, in 2015. Now I've seen conflicting things on this so i'm not 100 percent sure which way to go i'll say them both and say that i've heard them both and you can just make up your own mind um 2015 russell pool died at the age of 58 i've seen reports that it was an aneurysm and then i saw reports that it was a heart attack while he was talking to investigators about stuff about um the case which just makes me feel like was it you know is this another thing we need to look into if it's an aneurysm I, I get that they probably can't fake those god i hope they can't but like yeah but are they in with the me i mean we have is the medical questions. examiner writing the truth or are they getting paid off in seven pounds of cocaine or bisquick <laughs> <laughs> My point just being like, yeah, now I'm in like full X-Files mode, meaning mm -hmm. trust no one. So continue. hundred percent. Yeah. So at this point in the case, direct, directive, Jesus, I'm so sorry. Uh, Detective Poole has found dirty cops. He thinks they're involved. The case at this point for Biggie's murder has stalled. So Valletta Wallace Faith Evans and Biggie's two children file a lawsuit against the LAPD for misconduct in handling Biggie's case. The LAPD's reaction was like, okay, well, we're going to start a task force called Operation Transparency to re-examine the case. Not because they actually gave a shit as to what happened, just that they thought if someone could exonerate them, then they wouldn't have to pay the money. Right. Um, because the lawsuit was looking at $400 million, which uh, someone had put as Biggie's projected lifetime earnings. And I'm going to go further to say he probably would have made more than that. But right. Sure. So May, tw May 2006, Detective Greg Kading, who you may or may not remember, from our Tupac and Elisa Lamb episodes. Yes. Gets put on the new task force. He gathers all of the info from previous files that he can find linked to Biggie's murder. The result is 92 four inch binders. Swoon. <laughs> <laughs> so many binders. Yeah. The joke is I, I do have a photo of all of those binders and. I just, just give me a box of them. I just, just let me see a few. Yep. Uh, so a cassette tape was recovered from the desk drawer of a detective named Stephen Katz, uh, which was confiscated during this Operation Transparency. On the cassette, the detective was heard interviewing a jailhouse informant who confirmed that Rafael Perez had worked for Death Row Records and that on the night of Biggie's murder, he called David Mack. Now, I get that he could call him for numerous reasons, but what are the odds of that? Yeah. Um, we don't know anything about why he would have called him. Um, we do know the police believed it was a professional hit and that it involved multiple people, possibly with the use of radios, and that radios were found at Mack's house along with multiple nine millimeters, 
which were just like what killed Biggie. And again, they didn't test them. So also during this investigation, Detective Kading brought in a woman that they call Teresa Swan. Now, this is not her real name. It's a name they've used in order to like protect her uh, because she fears Suge and rightly so. Right. Um, Swan has a daughter with Suge, which I just feel like if he hears that, it's like, well, that should narrow it down. He only has so many children, I'm assuming. Yeah. Well, that's just it. It's like, well, I get, but also like, I feel like at this point he knows who she is. Um, but, uh, she also visited Biggie or not Biggie. Sorry. She visited Suge in jail before Biggie was murdered. Kading knew that Teresa had info about the man they believed murdered Biggie. He's a man named Darnell Bolton, AKA Wardell Foos, AKA Poochie. Uh, but he also knew that Teresa was terrified of Suge. So now Blanche gets a little less interested in Detective Kading. He devises a plan that I'm just uncomfortable with. He makes up a series of documents claiming to be a confession from Poochie about the murder of Biggie. He confesses that Poochie is part of this gang that they know he's part of. They confess how they feel the murder went down. They date the documents April Fo- April 1st, which is April Fool's Day, because they thought that was funny. And I'm just like, oh, you're better than that, Detective Kading. So Teresa sees these documents, says that, yes, it happened the way Poochie says it did. Teresa claims after Tupac was shot, Suge was enraged. He felt like he lost a brother. Teresa would go to the jail with Suge's lawyer, David Kenner, and pretend to be his assistant so she could talk to the Suge without any guards in the room. During this time, Teresa claims that Suge asked her to pay Poochie to take care of him. So Teresa and Poochie had meetings at Denny's, of all places, uh, to talk things over. Moons so- over my murder, you know what I mean? Right. Thank you. Uh, at a meeting shortly after Biggie's death, Teresa said that Poochie's Impala appeared to have been recently painted, which is weird. Uh, Teresa also claims that she gave po- that Poochie was given nine thousand dollars, came back asking for more, saying he needed to skip town until things cooled down. So he was given an additional four thousand, and then Teresa just never heard from him again. The witnesses were never shown Poochie's photo, so he couldn't be identified as a possible shooter. Uh, Poochie, it should be noted, was a Looters Park Pyro member, which is like a subset of the of the Bloods, which uh, Suge is part of. Um, and he was known for executing mob hits. Suge's quote about Poochie is, quote, he doesn't fuck around. <laughs> Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Now, a member of Death Row security, Reggie Wright Jr., said Poochie did some favor for Suge. Suge took him down to George Chevrolet out there on Lakewood Boulevard, told him to pick out any car on the lot. And Poochie chose a dark green Impala. Mm. According to Teresa, the Impala was dark green, just like the vehicle the witnesses spotted at Biggie's murder. Now, apparently, Detective Kading made some false statements to get a warrant in a previous case. So the LAPD used that as their excuse to pull him from this case. An internal investigation did clear him of any wrongdoing, but I guess he's just not that squeaky clean cop that we all thought he was. He then made copies of his files, resigned, and wrote a book called Murder Rap, which he dedicated to Biggie's and Tupac's moms. Um, The book was then made into a documentary of the same name. I did watch the documentary when I did the Tupac episode, and then I read the book this time around. 
Um, while Kading was pulled from the case, no one was brought in as a replacement and the investigation just kind of stopped because Kading showed her showed or had at least a lot of information saying, hey, it wasn't the cops. It was this guy, Poochie. And the cops went, oh, thank God. OK, yeah, go back to uh, the lawsuit that Valletta and Biggie's family char- filed against us and let them know wasn't the cops. We're good. We don't owe the money. So now they don't give a shit if the case is solved or not. So 2003, Poochie was killed in a drive-by shooting. Shut up. Police say he was shot in the back while riding his motorcycle in Compton and that his death was just the result of infighting between the mob pyros and that it that's about as solved as it will ever be. Mm-hmm. Jesus. Could also just be someone tying up loose ends, but you know, what do I know? Uh, <laughs> Yeah. In, in the original police file, police said immediately that Biggie's shooting was just a gang related shooting, payback for Tupac's death. Uh, quote, the information that we're getting is that this is connected. So, like, their very first thing they're writing about this case is that they're like, oh, yeah, it's just a mob. It's like a, it's a gang thing. It's fine. So they right away had just written this whole thing off. So the big issues for me. Um, Lil Cease and G Money, who were in the vehicle with Biggie, both said that the Impala was dark green. Some of the police reports also state that it's dark green. But Russell Poole and later Detective Greg Kading say the Impala was black. Now, I just don't know if they're trying to push a specific narrative. Um... Because some people in this case who happen to own black Impala SS vehicles are David Mack, Suge Knight, and Keefe D. Now, it was said that Kading knew right away it was a dark green Impala, but his entire book says it's black. And so it's almost like, was it? I don't know. I go with the people who were there in the car who saw it and were like, it was dark green. So I say it was more them. I like the idea that David Mack has a car of the same color, but I still feel like I'm not saying David Mack's innocent. He obviously has some issues, but um, so Faith Evans, back to her, released a book called Keep the Faith where she claimed she volunteered to call Biggie's mom after Biggie's death. However, every single article I've read and documentary I've seen there, and there've been many, um, each one says it was D-Rock who called Miss Wallace, right. not Faith. Uh, there are also other things in Faith's book that she claims that Biggie's friends deny. Uh, but honestly, I just didn't have time to read her book because at some point, dear listeners, I do need to sleep. Um but I just find it interesting. It just feels very like, well, at this point, what's going to sell something more than I was married to him when he was tragically murdered. So it just felt more like a money grab than anything else. Um, Speaking of which in December, 99 bad boy records released born again, which was an album consisting of previously unreleased material mixed with new guest appearances which the Source magazine (laughs) described as, quote, compiling some of the most awkward collaborations of his career. Faith Evans then did a duet album called The King and I, which just featured songs of her and Biggie that were released in May of 2017. Uh, Three albums of Biggie's were released posthumously, those two plus a duet's The Final Chapter, There were two compilation albums as well as a soundtrack for a movie called Notorious. Now, I love that my brain is already still in Tupac mode. Biggie was the heart and soul of Brooklyn. To this day, he is considered to be one of the most influential lyricists of all time who changed the course of hip hop. 
he has sold 30 million albums worldwide. In 2006, MTV ranked him number three on their list of greatest MCs of all time, calling him possibly the most skillful ever on the mic. Now, I was very curious about that note. So I looked into their top 10 and it was like, okay, 10 is like LL Cool J. You got Eminem, you got Ice Cube, Big Daddy Kane. I mean, Nas is in there. Biggie is number three. Tupac is number two. Number one is Jay-Z. Do really? We, do we feel this strongly about Jay-Z? I also find it fascinating to be like, you know what? For greatest of all time, we're going to say he's number three, but we're also going to say he was the most skillful. So I find it fascinating that yeah. he can be the best, but also bronze, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> yeah, great point. Yeah. So in 2020, Biggie was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, and then now this I find kind of fascinating. So Sotheby's is a 270-year-old auction house. It's like a fancy plant fancy pants kind of place um they became the first major international auction house to do a sale that focused on hip-hop september 15th 2020 sotheby's held a celebration of the history and cultural impact hip-hop had on art and culture from the late 70s through the mid 90s so it compromised of unique artifacts contemporary art photos vintage modern fashion historic and newly designed jewelry flyers posters there were love letters written by tupac when he was like 16 to his high school girlfriend um which i was very also upset that she just didn't keep those for life yeah um and then in just three days before biggie's death he did a photo shoot for rap pages magazine where he wore this plastic crown on his head kind of askew um and afterwards he signed the crown well this crown is just like a plastic prop uh from a party store and the sotheby's estimated they'd probably get between 200 and 300,000 for this crown it went for $600,000 whoa that's crazy yeah and i mean again like i get how crazy that is the love letters from Tupac only went for like 75. Really? And it's like, you know what? I'd be more interested in reading those. But again, that shows Blanche's true colors. Blanche has a bias. And that bias is eyelashes. (laughs) Stop it. (laughs) I like it. Police. Now, Detective Poole, his belief is that Suge put a hit on Tupac because he was leaving death row records and was owed millions in royalties. Poole was like an old school kind of cop. And he thinks that Suge put a hit on Biggie to take the focus off of him and the whole Tupac situation. Now death row was openly involved in drug trafficking. 30 to 40 officers worked off duty for death row records. Suge had a lot of power dozens of police and a a, a district attorney in his pocket. So Poole thinks Tupac's death was meant to look like a gang hit between the Bloods and the Crips, but Suge set up a casino fight for the sake of providing a motive for the Crips to do a hit on Tupac and that it all turned around in There's a lot of heat on him. People are starting to think it could be him. He had just got sentenced to nine years in jail for a parole violation. So you got to do something to take the heat off him. Well, take out Biggie. And then it looks like it's just a big old gang rivalry. So is what it looks like. Um, To me, I feel, and I know this might be bold. I feel like the police just didn't try in this episode. In this episode, as though it was an episode. In our episode. I feel like the police just didn't try. In their report, there was a very specific section that said an anonymous call was made after Biggie's murder identifying blank, because unfortunately 
they released the files, but redacted a lot of it. Um, they identified someone that was involved, told LAPD there are over 500 of that name in the phone directory. So no further follow-up was done, although it was found later on that there was a police officer with the same name. But they never looked into it. Uh, so police automatically for me, I don't know where I'm feeling there. Um, Puffy once again, so sorry, Puffy, super sketchy to me. I don't think, yeah, I don't think he was involved. I don't think that he did it himself. I don't think he wanted Biggie dead. I don't think he knew that Biggie was going to die. I think he feels incredibly responsible because I think he had something to do with the hit on Tupac and he realizes this was like a retaliation. Puffy's quote after Biggie died was, quote, time heals all wounds, but some things you just have to live with. To me, that feels like someone is guilty as hell. Um, Well, and also too, you know, I, I just feel like in the documentary I watched too, it was like, Puffy was trying to go out on his own and make his own name with bad boy records. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and Biggie went with him. Biggie was like, yes, I'm going absolutely like no questions asked. So like if I'm saying again, you know, we're speculating here. Of course, if Tupac had, or sorry, excuse me. If Puffy had something to do with Tupac's death and someone wanted to get back at Puffy for that, Mm-hmm. instead of killing Puffy, killing his like number one supporter, number one cash cow, the star who mm-hmm. believed in him, who was going to, you know, take his record label and make it a thing to begin with. Yeah. That would be Biggie. So again, like it, it does make sense if, if, you know, if we're to believe again, speculating that Puffy had something to do with Tupac's death, it does make sense that a retaliation would absolutely have been to kill Biggie. Because again, yes, of course you can kill Puffy, fine. But again, it's like, it's one of those things where it's like, that's like giving someone the death sentence versus life in prison, right? Like Mm -hmm. you kill him, then okay, it's over, whatever. You kill Biggie, you've killed Puffy's moneymaker, the person who believed in him more than anything, the person who was becoming a star that made his record label even have any sort of kind of credibility. You know, like that really is hitting him where it hurts and making him live Mm -hmm. a life, you know, taking that away from him. So I can see that that would absolutely be Again, the retaliation, it does kind of make sense. That is 100% why I think Puffy had something to do with Tupac. Right. Because there was a big competition and he knew if without Tupac, Death Row Records would start to crumble. And that's all it took. He pulled out the right... uh, Oh, I was going to make a reference. What's that? (laughs) He pulled out the right Jenga block and the whole You take tower. a block from the bottom and you put it on top. And it just You take a block crumbling. from the middle and you put it on top. And then it feels like, oh yeah, you take mine, I take yours. So totally. that's what it feels like. And Suge had the power. He has the connections. Um, I will also say at some point, Puffy just stopped cooperating with the investigation And when he found out that his bodyguard, Eugene Deal, who is someone who was in the car with Puffy at the time of the murder, uh, when he found out Eugene spoke with the police, Puffy fired him and refused to rehire him. So again, I bring you back to the moment he told D-Rock, any of us get our names on the witness list, you're all fired. Yeah. Now, listen, we need to wrap this up, obviously, uh, but very quickly, the only little piece, because as you know, once in a blue moon, old Ash has like a little piece of of knowledge she can try and add into the conversation because your research, of course, is truly fucking unbelievable. Um, But here's the one thing I will say. Now, I did not exist in Hollywood in 1997 when all of this happened. So I cannot speak to exactly how things would work at that time. But 
having existed in Hollywood at a time where you're somebody who has a car, okay, you're at an event and you have a car that's waiting for you. Now, if you've hired your own car service or the event in question has hired a car service for you, there is a string of people who have access to that information. So now for me, for example, prior to COVID, if you go to, if I go to an event and I have a car, that means not only does my publicist, my publicist assistant's anyone who works on the show that I work on in the publicity department, all of them would know exactly who I would be supposed to be going with the phone number, the contact information, et cetera. But I personally also have that information. So in 1997, when cell phones were still just kind of like a new thing, I'm not sure what the protocol was, but for me, again, I can speak to my experience. If I'm at an event, I have a car waiting or or a, a car service for the night. I text my driver or I call my driver and I say, hey, I'm ready to go. And they're like, cool, I'll be there. So here's what happens. When there's one of these events happening in the little side streets that are all around, it is lined with all of these cars that are waiting for all of the talent or famous people or whoever you want to label them that are at the event. So there is a lot of room in this case. I I share this because when you're, you're describing like, He's in the car. How did they know what car he was in? And like the cars that are passing and stuff like that. There's a lot of room for a lot of people to know who's driving who. Drivers get out of cars and talk to one another. Again, this is in 1997. People aren't glued to their phones then, right? So if there's 15 cars lined up on a side street, all those drivers, for all we know, are getting out and chit-chatting. What else are you going to do with your time as you're all waiting, you know, for the hours until your, your people are ready to go. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing, congestion. Anytime you're at any sort of event like this, where there's a lot of people who have car services, it's congestion. Does it make it a good opportunity for a drive-by? I would say no, because there's so many cars and people and trying to get places. But then at the same time, if you were connected to the point that you would know the, if you would know truly the exact moment that person is in that car and where they're going and you knew that the other way would be clear. Yeah. It would be a great opportunity for a drive by because there's so many cars because there's so many cars that look exactly the same. And to that, I say, and listen, I know this is a bold statement, but how would you have that kind of information and the kind of information about traffic patterns, et cetera, a police connection. I'm just saying. I mean, I already forget if I mentioned it, but there was talk that like at one point there were police outside the museum because they were supposed to be helping with crowd control at that point because it had been shut down. There was uh, multiple witnesses that saw certain police on like a phone or radio like seconds before uh, Biggie was shot. I mean, all of the stuff that you brought up and I I can't, again, we're running out of time, but all of the stuff you brought up about all of the police, their connections, the way that they could have potentially been involved to me, again, people talk, drivers talk, I'm assuming, there's just a large amount of possibility for a large amount of people to have the information. Again, like my point only is, is that me who is not, you know, biggie at that point was like the biggest star in the world. Me, when I go to an event, there's probably like 25 people who have that information about like, what's her driver's name? What's her driver's number? When is she moving? Where is she going? Like there's all of this kind of communication constantly happening. So if that's what's happening for me, I'm saying that for like this big star, there's a lot of people who are constantly communicating about like, where's he going? What's he doing? Does he want his car? Is he ready to go? He's ready to go. Okay. He's getting into the car. Like it's like that every move thing, you know, like there's people who are constantly keeping, keeping tabs. And again, in general, because of the congestion, it doesn't lend itself to that kind of crime because there's, you're moving so slowly and it's really hard to kind of go. But again, 
if you knew that there was going to be a break in traffic, if you were somebody that was had that kind of knowledge or what have you, it could be a great point to pull up, to pull a crime because as I'm saying, every all of those drivers are in very similar vehicles. It would be very difficult to delineate. Like you were saying, you're like, there's like four people who have the exact same car. That's like now, again, I'm speaking pre-COVID, but going to an event, it's like there's a line of like 20 Chevy Suburbans. And it's like, well, I don't know which one's mine. I don't know. Like I call the person and then I hope that they come and find me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, again, like you're also, you know, dealing with when you're dealing with talent and I can say this disparagingly because I'm one, I'm a, you know, I am one on some level. Um, we don't know. It's like, well, I got a number and I, I text or I call this person and then they'll show up and they'll take me. And when the person says my name, I get in their car. That's the other thing, by the way. Like, I know that in this case they had drivers that they knew specifically and it was their own service. Fine. But there's so much room for error. There's so much room for like, somebody's like, you're with me. And you go, okay. Cause I've been, I've had car services where somebody picks me up, takes me to an event. But then when I go to leave, it's a new driver. So I'm just saying again, like there's just so much room for, yeah. If you're planning a hit on someone, does that feel like your first choice? I would say no. But again, if you have the extra knowledge, if you have the extra connections, et cetera, it is actually a great choice to pull off a hit because there's so much chaos. Just saying. And to that I say, and I love that this is my main thought to come back with. You are the talent. <laughs> Not on this show, baby. And it Not on this it, show. No. Uh, and it, is a big relief to know that 35 people or 25 people might know where you are at all times. That does make me feel better. It's you know. true. But in the cases like we're talking about, that's a lot of mouths to be yapping. You know what oh, I'm saying? Yeah. In this, in this case, it was, it was probably not great, but in your case, <laughs> love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, listen, do you have anything else you want to get to before we sign off? Because this has been a wild ride. I would love nothing more than to just keep talking powerhouse ladies from the nineties. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we could do an entire episode where we just talk nineties music, you know? And I, again, I know that there might be a lot of people out there, um, specifically young people who are like, "Ooh, I like 90s music. I love it. And it's like, and that's great. You don't know it till you're in it. Like the 90s were such a weird, very, very time. weird. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't know it till you're there. Um, I mean, this week, Blanche was all over the face, all over the face. I meant to say all over the place. Oh. I don't, I think you've come up with a new catchphrase and I'm here for it. That was incredibly perfect. Uh, because I'm, I believe in that, uh, Netflix one, uh, that Netflix documentary about Biggie, the first person to speak was D-Rock where I went, um, who's that? Um, he caught me off guard. Yeah. He's an attractive gentleman. Um, no, not the time, Christy, not the time. Um, I just, this, I mean, what I love about this show, um, and there are many things, I love that I'm learning so much about things that it's like, I knew like just the tiniest bit about it, but I didn't know all of this back stuff. And there was so much back stuff I did not know. And I've been listening to like Biggie albums, which is a weird thing. And I get made fun of by my teenager when he walks in the door and hears music. And the joke is, he has become like, he really likes hypnotize and big Papa. And he's like, he's realized like there are some nineties jams that are really worth giving a listen. And I'm like, yes, there are, but you wouldn't fully get it until you like, you just, it was a different time and you don't know it till you're there. And I'm sure people in the eighties can say the same thing about the eighties. Um, I don't know where I was going because now I'm already distracted by D rocks face. The point is, I, 
at the time when this happened, I'm still shocked to think that Biggie was 24 years old. I know. Because when I think about it, I'm like, he was like in his 30s, right? Um, and even at the time, like Puffy was only like early 20s. And so he was just this scrawny thing that was like, who knows? And I mean, again, he has really grown into his own, but, (laughs) but this is, this is like when you liked the Joker, Um, but it doesn't mean I have to like him on the inside. It doesn't. The point is, I think he was involved in Tupac somehow, and then he's been carrying the guilt of Biggie ever since. And I would love to get into that therapist computer if I can branch out to another computer that I would like to look into. Well, here's what I want to say. Yeah. Christy, 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 can't you see all of your... I already fucked it up. Christy, 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 can't you see all of your research surprises me? It was kind of close. I liked that a lot. Like... (laughs) And I just love your detective ways. This is, I mean, come on. Jokes aside, though, excellent fucking work, as always. The, you're, the, the, this cop stuff is, I mean, I took a lot of notes. Well, look at this. This is my paper. Like, I took a lot of notes while we were talking. This is wild. Uh, you never cease to amaze, Christy Oxborough. And I thank you for all that you do for this show. Now, always, before, later, thank you. I know it's March, but I'm not ready yet. <laughs> I, ah! I made that uh, New Year's resolution to accept a compliment. And you did. I sat, I think I accepted one very quickly. You did. And then just <laughs> trailed off. Uh, so mm, I just, I, it's weird to get positive. Again, just say positive things to your kids so they don't end up awkward. <laughs> But here's the thing. We could try it again. Like, I'll just say great job and you could just say thanks. Christy Oxborough, as always, great job. <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we like to call a breakthrough. We're going to go right now. We're going to go and record another episode. It's a bonus uh, last call episode that we put on our Patreon. What's Patreon, you ask? Go to patreon.com slash truecrimeandcocktails where you can learn more about the subscription service that will give you bonus episodes of True Crime and Cocktails. We do lots of fun stuff. We do live Q&As. We have fun guest stars, all kinds of great stuff. So go there for more information about that. If you're looking for merch, because I know people have been asking, new to us, people, welcome again. Thank you so much for coming and finding us. Go to bonfire.com slash true dash crime dash and dash cocktails. I'm so drunk. I'm like, hey, what is it? And uh, we have lots of different designs, T-shirts, hoodies, all of the above. We have lots of different colors. Now we are selling out. So get there as soon as you can. Again, bonfire.com slash true dash crime dash and dash cocktails. If you haven't followed us on Instagram yet, it's at true crime and cocktails. Similarly on Facebook and on Twitter, we are at Not Detectives. Lots of information. We appreciate all of you so very much. We love doing this show, and you continuing to listen allows us to do so. So thank you so much for all of your support. Christy, oh, before we get going, next episode, oh, now I'm excited about this. We have gotten a lot of requests, and we appreciate all of our listener requests for different episodes. And next week, we are going to make some dreams come true because next week on True Crime and Cocktails, Famous Fatalities Edition, We are going to be covering the case of Madeline McCann. Buckle up. It's going to be a bumpy ride. We'll see you then. Thanks so much for listening.